Good morning. The committee will come to order. Pursuant to notice, the Committee on Science and Technology uh, is here to consider the following measures. H.R. 5781, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Authorization Act of 2010. But before we get started, I would like to introduce one of our guests. Uh, Mr. Sajazi is the president of the Italian Space Agency here in the front row, and we welcome you here, Mr. Sajazi. Italy has been an important partner uh, with us in space in many other uh, ways, and we look forward to continuing uh, to work with you. And glad you're here to see um, sausage uh, being made uh, right up uh, front. All right, we will now proceed with the markup. Uh, this has been a challenging road to get to today's markup because the issue we are addressing go to the core of what we want from NASA and from our nation's space and aeronautics program. This committee, and in particular the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, under the able leadership of uh, Chairwoman Giffords and Ranking Member Olson, have tried to make the time needed to explain those issues uh, and examine them carefully and to get as much information as we could from the administration about its proposed plans for NASA. As a result, the bill before us today reflects the constructive input of the many witnesses who testified at 19 hearings at the committee and subcommittee level and have held uh, to date on this issue during the 111th Congress. We've also heard from a variety of experts and stakeholders from the government, commercial sector, the science community, the aerospace safety advisory panel and other advisory committees, and numerous organizations and individuals. We have benefited from all their views. And let me be clear, the bill before us today is not perfect. I believe that there are a number of amendments that will be offered today that will improve it. That's what the legislative process is all about. However, I think it's a good bill that makes the hard choices that need to be made, and we are in a tough economic times, and we cannot do it all. <clears throat> well, I believe it is important that NASA remain a multi-mission agency with challenging initiatives in science, aeronautics, and human spaceflight and exploration. I also want to ensure that NASA's missions are matched to the available resources. As a result, some of the nice-to-haves have had to be deferred, and worthy activities have been funded at lower levels than some of us would like. Nevertheless, I think the legislation before us sets a clear, sustainable, and executable path for NASA, especially in the areas of human spaceflight. That <clears throat> has been a part of the dilemma that we have been confronted with. For all of us and for all of its accomplishments, the Constellation program uh, was not executable as planned, given the budgetary outlook facing the agency. Unfortunately, it has become clear that the administration's proposed human spaceflight program is not executionable under that budgetary outlook either. As a result, we've had to craft an alternative approach that is executionable and that has taken some time, but I believe that the bill before us today provides the nation with a productive future for its human spaceflight program, one that can be sustained even in the midst of a budgetary uncertainty. It is in the interest of time that I will not restate what's in the bill. Instead, I will simply say that this bill represents a balanced, fiscal responsible, and bipartisan approach to authorizing NASA's programs. I want to emphasize the fact that it is a bipartisan bill and that in that regard, I'm gratified that Ranking Member Hall and Ranking Member Olson have joined Chairwoman uh, Giffords and I as original co-sponsors of this legislation. They have made thoughtful and constructive contributions to the bill, and I thank them for that. I imagine that there will be amendments before us today on which of the four of us uh, may disagree. But no one should construe that to mean that we are not united on the need for a strong, robust, and innovative space and aeronautics program for the United States. The bipartisan nature of this bill sends an important message to Congress as a whole, as well as to the administration, that NASA is a national resource worthy of our support. Let me just quickly conclude by saying um, that what in all candor, uh, the Constellation program was brought to us by people uh, that, that had a very sincere interest. We found, though, that as it moved along, that it resulted in a balloon mortgage that we could not afford now. Once again, the program that the administration put forth um, was done in all good faith. But once again, we found uh, that that balloon mortgage. We really have to work within our means here. Uh, even looking at the Senate bill, we are afraid that it is not within the, those budgetary guidelines. And I'm afraid that 
the, the passion that we all have on this committee for NASA may not be shared across the board. And as we start getting into tough budgetary times, we really need, I think, to be responsible and coming in uh, with a good budget. And the reason this is so important is that NASA really is, I think, the best brand in the world. It is the statement that the United States is a leader in technology uh, and innovation. And so we have a responsibility on this committee, uh, I think, to nurture it and to move it, it, move it forward. Uh, uh, we all know that we're getting close to election time. We all know that people's trigger finger gets a little bit itchy uh, at that time. Uh, but I have uh, been so impressed uh, with the cooperation on the staff level, on the member level, to try to pull these things together. Folks have parochial interest. I know that there will be some, you know, some tough issues today that will be very heartfelt, but we're gonna, you know, we need to work through these. Working together, we're going to come out uh, with the kind of bill that we can all be uh, proud of. And again, I thank you, and I would like to then yield um, uh, to Ms. Giffords uh, as chairwoman uh, of the committee for a brief statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member oh, Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate this opportunity. Truly, for the members who have been on my subcommittee and in the full committee, this really is at a, is at a point where we're at a crossroads. Um, our job here in this committee is to determine the future of America's spaceflight program, and our job is to determine whether or not America will continue to have a human spaceflight program, second to none, or not. We will determine whether America will continue to push the forefront of space, science, and technology or not. We will determine whether America will continue to foster innovation and drive our 21st century economy or not. And today we'll determine whether America will continue to inspire the youth of America or not. Of course, we didn't arrive at this crossroad suddenly. Over the last year and a half, my subcommittee held 15 oversight hearings on NASA, exploring these and the many issues facing today's spaceflight program. And over the last year and a half, we've had to face an unsettling reality. After the Augustine Committee made clear our exploration program of record was unexecutable under the current budget. So in response to this report, the President introduced his 2011 budget, which included a number of serious changes to NASA programs. We then had four hearings with witnesses from NASA as well as outside experts to delve into these proposals and to the effects on our spaceflight program. Unfortunately, many of our questions remained unanswered. So the leadership of the committee twice reached out to NASA to get a better justification of the President's proposals, and twice we were rebuffed. Even to this day, we've yet to receive a budget that reflects the changes to the new plan that the President announced on April 15th. Our hope is in the future that we'll be able to work closely with the administration and with NASA to make sure that we have the information so we could move forward um, in, in a closer manner. So when we set out our task to determine the future of America's spaceflight program, our goal was paramount in our minds to develop a sustainable program that will guarantee America's access to lower Earth's orbit, but more importantly, a path to explore beyond LEO, something that we have not done for 37 years. And the result is a bill that provides a pragmatic path forward and gives NASA a clear sense of purpose and a direction in a way that will recognize these, the nation's need for fiscal restraint. And I've said many times before, the President's request contained a lot of good proposals, which this bill, in fact, has retained. And, Mr. Chairman, of course, I know you'll get into this, but our legislation authorizes NASA's programs and activities for five years, with total annual funding of $19 billion in fiscal year 2011, rising modestly to... $20.99 billion in fiscal year 2015. It extends through at least 2020 the life of the International Space Station, a premier laboratory that should be considered a modern wonder of the universe. And it continues and, in fact, expands our commitment to science and aeronautics. However, our approach differs from the President's proposal on a number of levels, most notably on the development of human spaceflight programs, and the bill directs the NASA Administrator to restructure the current exploration program to develop and demonstrate a governmentally owned crew transportation system to provide assured access to LEO as well as heavy lift transportation systems to provide the backbone for exploration missions. Um, as we've often stated, our role in Congress is not to pick winners and losers. We're not trying to design a rocket in this committee. We know that the best and brightest minds in the country are in the NASA centers around the country, and they should be designing the architecture. So this bill requires NASA to bring those minds to bear on this issue. NASA will tell us in the following months how they'll fly to ISS by 2016 in a crew vessel evolvable to one day explore the solar system. NASA will tell us how they'll build a heavy lift vehicle that will begin flying by the end of this decade and prepare us to once again leave LEO. 
The restructured exploration program will ensure that America will continue to play a leadership role in human space flight and exploration in spite of challenging economic times. The bill also recognizes the value of encouraging the growth of a healthy, self-sustaining U.S. commercial space sector by providing the nascent commercial crew industry with access to NASA technologies and facilities and assistance in the forms of loans and loan guarantees. Additionally, this bill reinforces that NASA will turn over crew transportation to commercial providers when they have proven that they can accomplish the task successfully. The prize is out there. It's up for the American entrepreneurs to seize it. This bill also contains another of great pieces I know that we're going to get into a little bit later today, but I want to again thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know that you've worked very hard with Ranking Member Hall and Congressman Olson as well, and so many members of this committee who are directly involved uh, with NASA's human spaceflight programs and NASA centers around the country or have constituents that are really interested in human spaceflight. The fact is that, as you said, Mr. Chairman, the clock is ticking. We don't have a lot of time, and this is our opportunity for this committee to put its best foot forward. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Giffords, and for the work you and Mr. Olson did in the many hearings that you had. And I now yield to Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I thank you. I think I thank you for scheduling this morning's markup. Uh, I sit here thinking about the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take of first, do no harm. And from the devastation we all felt when the president ran a line through the word constellation, uh, that's been our goal and my goal. And I'm on this bill as a co-sponsor in an effort to do less harm than I think the, the bill across the hall is going to do. But we need to get the best of both and, and work together and try to, try to work this thing through because a lot, of, a lot depends on our actions here. And, and uh, I, I want to begin by commending your leadership and that of your subcommittee, uh, Chairwoman Gabriel Giffords and Ranking Subcommittee Member Pete Olson with excellent oversight hearings conducted during this Congress on NASA's management and execution of its programs. We heard from an impressive array of industry, government, and academic witnesses. And I want to especially note the compelling testimony we heard from former astronauts Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, and Tom Stafford. These extraordinary men bring a lifetime of experience and a wisdom to the debate. And I appreciate the time and effort that they took to appear before the committee. The work of the Space Committee and full committee was very aggressive and very thorough and helped all members gain good insight into the agency, science, aeronautics, and human space flight programs. The hearings and briefings also reveal that NASA was unable to provide convincing reasoning for its decision to cancel Constellation. In spite of repeated requests by this committee, NASA failed to provide credible schedules, cost estimates, and a coherent rationale as to why it was necessary to wipe away $10 billion in taxpayer investment in Constellation to start anew with an ill-defined plan that risked taxpayers' money on a commercial-only solution. NASA also failed to offer convincing evidence that its proposed $6 billion investment in a commercial crew initiative would have any reasonable chance of succeeding, or even that careful thought had been given to the basic assumptions about safety, marketability, liability, indemnification, and intellectual property considerations. Mr. Chairman, the bipartisan bill before us today directs NASA to build on key components of Constellation to ensure a robust human space exploration program. It emphasizes that NASA should rely on our investments in the Ares-1 and Orient launch systems to the maximum extent practicable, and that work should be phased to begin a gradual buildup of a heavy lift launch vehicle. This bill also, the bill also includes important policy provisions directing NASA to transition low Earth orbit crew uh, ferry flights to the commercial industry when it demonstrates the capability to NASA's satisfaction. Until that day, however, the least risky path to minimize our reliance on the Russians is to continue developing a low Earth orbit launch system such as was envisioned by the Constellation program. This bill before us takes the right approach for NASA's other important missions. It sustains a strong and vibrant space science program, enabling new missions to help scientists better understand the evolution of our solar system and universe. It provides funding for important uh, aeronautics uh, research designed to increase the capability and the capacity of our national airspace system to make aircraft quieter, safer, and more fuel efficient. This bill also fully funds the administration's request for NASA's space technology program. 
This initiative is designed to revitalize NASA's long-term high-risk research and development activities with the goal of enabling a broad set of new capabilities ranging from propulsion systems, materials, sensors, and other technologies. We'll need to extend our reach into the deep space. Mr. Chairman, given that our members received a copy of the text just three days ago, I ask that we continue to work together between now and consideration on the House floor to improve the bill so that all of us can enthusiastically support it. I also want to recognize the hard work done by your staff in crafting this bill and the bipartisan manner by which they've worked with our staff throughout the course of the Congress, with special uh, kudos extended to Dick Oberman. He's been very open with us, and he's we're appreciative of all of his efforts. I also want to thank Ken Munro and Ed Fetterman on my staff for their excellent work and guidance through this process. Uh, given the budget constraints as well as the turmoil surrounding the direction of our human space flight program, it's vitally important that this good piece of legislation be enacted as soon as possible. I support this bill. I urge all members to lend their support to it as well. And I thank the other members of my staff who have worked day and night to help me. It's important that we get this legislation through Congress, get a bill, and get it to the President. And at that time, this time, Mr. Chairman, I yield what time I have left and what time he has to consume to uh, Subcommittee Chairman uh, Pete Olson. Well, I want to thank my great friend and fellow Texan, Mr. Hall, for yielding me a little time. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the National Aeronautics and Space Administration Authorization Act of 2010. We promised a NASA authorization bill this year, and I'm proud to say we're delivering on that promise here today in committee. I want to extend a very special thanks to our chairman, Mr. Gordon, and our ranking member, Mr. Hall, as well as the distinguished chairwoman of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, Ms. Giffords, along with the very dedicated and hardworking staff at the full committee. This authorization bill is very important to me personally. It's also important to the district I represent, Houston, Texas. But above all else, this authorization bill is important to our nation. And so I thank my colleagues again for bringing this to the committee and for exhibiting that in the spirit of doing what's right for America, bipartisan solutions exist in Washington, D.C. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Additional opening statements will be placed in the record at this time. I think we have something like 30-something amendments, so I believe everybody's going to have a chance to, uh, to have their say uh, on this bill today. So I ask unanimous consent that the bill uh, be considered as read and open amendments at the point, at, open for amendment at any point, and that members proceed with the amendments in the order of the roster. Without objection, so ordered. The first amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an, amend an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 039, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I and many of my colleagues here in the room have always maintained that a NASA-led vehicle is essential in order for us to maintain, I would say, our U.S. leadership and perhaps supremacy in space. And this bill strongly supports that premise. However, I think it's important that we consider other aspects. The development of commercial crew and cargo is an important component to our ensuring domestic access to the space station and to continuing to preserve our unique workforce through commercial and public-private partnerships that spur job creation. The level of commercial investment can be debated, whether it's Augustine's recommendation of $4.5 billion, the President's request of $6 billion, or the committee's level of less than a billion. However, we do know that the Senate authorizers and the appropriators have both now approved a level of funding that will help to develop this essential service. This amendment proposes to match the levels already approved by Senate authorizers and appropriators and to continue the development development method, which is currently in place for the commercial industry, uh, based on meeting milestone requirements. 
In addition, my amendment would pro replace provisions in the bill with language from the bill that I introduced in March with Senator Hutchison, which was adopted in the Senate Compromise Bill. This language would ensure that before allowing NASA to procure commercial crew services, we require that the agency meet a number of requirements, including human rating requirements, commercial market assessments, procurement system reviews, evaluation of government supplied capabilities, and infrastructure, flight demonstration, and readiness requirements, and commercial crew rescue capabilities. With these criteria in place, we recognize that public-private commercial space holds promise for the Space Coast and many other communities across the country. We must provide a level of support that will encourage the development of this job-creating industry. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back. Would anybody like to be heard on this amendment? I'd like to be heard. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I... I rise in opposition to the gentlelady's amendment. Her amendment would take roughly $2 billion out of the exploration program and redirect it to the commercial crew account. It also zero out the loan and loan guarantee provisions in the bill. Uh, for the last several years, we've, we've heard witnesses and expert panels complain about NASA being starved for funds needed to build an assured launch system. And now it, says, it now stands once the shuttle's retired, we'll be relying on the Russians for at least four years to get astronauts to and from the space station. Stripping away $2 billion to invest in a commercial cruise system is not the answer. NASA is being tasked in this bill to get us a low-Earth orbit launch system as soon as is practicable. We're also directing NASA to begin design and development of a heavy lift launch system in a carefully planned concurrent approach. $2 billion will delay our ability to get a new system into place. Further investing $2 billion with a commercial provider may or may not be sufficient. No engineering and market studies have been done that conclusively demonstrate the viability of a commercial space tourist uh, market. We've been working hard to direct all the funds we can to get the U.S. back into space. Expert witnesses have told us that the fastest, least risky, and most assured path is to build a government system. Uh, let's not start down the same path, draining funds from NASA's best hope of assured launch. Uh, we oppose this amendment. Ms. Guilford is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, like I said in my opening statements, we have some real issues being able to understand um, the development of the commercial systems that have been proposed by the administration. And I think, think that comes over into the, um, you know, the, the amendment here. Um, the Aerospace Corporation's own analysis raised some serious questions about the credibility of the administration's funding plan for commercial crew development. And my concern is that this amendment would make some significant cuts to the restructured exploration program, ultimately weakening, weakening its viability. And um, I, I respectfully would oppose this amendment because we've crafted a, a pretty important balance for the funding of this bill, and this amendment would disrupt that balance. Is there further discussion? Oh, Mr. Robacher is recognized. Yes, I uh, move to strike the last words, or I guess that's what we need to say here, but I move to uh, support the gentlelady's uh, amendment. Let's uh, just take a look at what we're deciding here. I mean, you know, basically, uh, gentlelady's deciding to give at least let's give commercial space a chance without her amendment what we're saying is we're going to put all of our eggs in the government run uh, space transportation basket uh, uh, we need to make sure that there is at least an alternative to having everybody who provides space transportation being a government employee and cutting out these the entrepreneurial uh, and commercial sector the lady wants to at least give that a chance now, I have uh, two amendments uh, later on that actually go a lot further, and obviously if uh, uh, the lady's uh, amendment passes, I will be withdrawing my amendment, or passes or fails, I'll probably be withdrawing my amendment, because uh, if, if, uh, we, what she's proposing is a, is a compromise position that permits us to move forward with commercial and doesn't just sort of cut the legs out from under uh, those people in the commercial sector that would like to build an industry uh, somewhat like perhaps the industry of the airline industry. We have reached a threshold where we're going to have to make a decision. 
Is space transportation going to be something that is nothing more than a government enterprise run by, paid for by the taxpayers and run by government employees? Or do we believe that the airline industry in the United States was a good idea when we reached the threshold that the private sector could provide transportation uh, to the public on jets and other type of vehicles? Uh, it's time for us to at least give the commercial enterprise a chance, and I uh, would hope that all of us uh, would, would support this position because it's a compromised position. What she's talking about is, is, is not just fully accepting what the President had in mind, but let me just note, Mr. Chairman, one of the reasons why there's some confusion here, we haven't had the hearings on this that we need to have, and I'm, I'm, I've worked well with you and uh, uh, with the Democrat majority, but let's face it. We haven't had one hearing that went to this idea, which, is, uh, which the gentlelady is actually amending, that would uh, 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 talk about the loan guarantee program. Now, where's loan guarantees? Uh, where does that fit in? How come we haven't had any hearings on that? Do we know the loan guarantees are going to work better than what the, what the uh, program now is designed for in terms of working with the, the development of commercial space alternatives? We don't know that. So uh, I think the gentlelady's uh, amendment is a, is a compromise. It's responsible. And uh, people on both sides of this issue, whether it should just be a government-run enterprise or whether we should get the private sector involved, should be supporting this as a compromise position. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. I would ask Mr. Olson or Ms. Giffords to correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that you did have hearings and there were witnesses from the commercial space uh, industry and that, that uh, these things were discussed. On the loan guarantee issue, Mr. Chairman? No. Not, not on the loan guarantee itself, that's right. but rather on the well, – um, That's an integral part okay. of what we're talking about here. Well, let me, let me say that um, I am – philosophically in tune with Ms. Cosmas and, and Mr. Robacher, but I am not fiscally um, attuned uh, to that. I would like to see us have alternatives. Uh, I think that we have left the options within this bill and other areas for a commercial um, uh, option, which I, I hope that can move forward. But this, is, this comes with a $2.3 billion price tag, and it's going to slow down, as Mr. Uh, Hall pointed out, uh, other programs. So. Uh, again, as I say, I'm, fis I'm, uh, I'm philosophically but not fiscally um, attuned to this, and for that reason, uh, we'll have to oppose the amendment. Are there any other – anyone else would like to be heard? If not, uh, if there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is the amendment offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin. Uh, Mr. Sensenbender, are you ready to proceed with your I amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 040, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbender of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, uh, this amendment is kind of a truth and statistics and truth and data amendment. Uh, what it does is it refers to the overlap between the climate data at the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom and the climate data that NASA has uh, assembled. Uh, ClimateGate has been uh, uh, something that has been discussed extensively in the global warming climate change community since the November 19, 2009 release of more than 1,000 emails and 2,000 documents from climate scientists associated with the Climate Research Institute at the University of East Anglia. It revealed a pattern of suppression, manipulation, and obstruction that pushed climate science toward predetermined outcomes in order to promote hysteria and, in my opinion, justify a heavy-handed regulatory response. The scandal was not confined to one British university and as it is widely acknowledged that there is substantial overlap between the CRU's temperature records and the temperature records at NASA. Therefore, if the Climate Research Unit's records are suspect, NASA's might very well be true. This amendment isn't about whether climate change is real. 
It's about the integrity of the scientific process and the scientific records that we use to set life-altering policies. This amendment would require NASA to investigate and report to Congress on the degree to which its temperature records overlap with the CRUs and the potential that those records may be flawed. As we continue with the debate on climate science, I think it is important that we clear the air on whether NASA's records ended up being polluted as a result of the scandal that arose in England. And all I am asking for is a report to Congress about whether the records were intermingled and the potential that the records may be flawed. And that way, when we deal with this issue in the next Congress, I think we can have more confidence in the records that are set before us. So that way, I urge the adoption of this amendment. All it does is require a report to Congress, which is a report that I think is necessary, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. Would anyone like to uh, – uh, Dr. Baird is recognized. Thank the Chairman. Um, as my colleagues know, I'm often uh, uh, consistently a, a strong advocate for openness in data, and uh, uh, and have read uh, many of the reports on this over since the issue first emerged. The, I have two concerns. First of all, uh, I find that the scrutiny of of data, uh, if we're going to be open about analyzing data, we need to be critical of data sets. We need to be equally critical on both sides, at the very least. I note that the, my colleagues in the majority previously heard from a, a putative scientist who claims to have been awarded a Nobel Prize, and he had no such thing, and there's very little uh, scrutiny that comes from the other side on that. But on the matter at hand, uh, the, question, the problem I have with the particular language, and I'd, I'd ask the author of the amendment if he'd willing, be willing to consider this, there is a somewhat conclusory statement that I'm not comfortable putting into this legislation, and the conclusory statement begins on line three. The integrity of the CRU's data set was compromised by the ClimateGate email scandal. That's not an open objective request for information. That's a conclusory statement about the integrity of a data set. And, and will the gentleman is, yield? I'd be happy to. Will the gentleman support this amendment if we strike uh, the word the in lines three and all of lines four and five? Uh, that eliminates what I would be. I personally would be. I can't speak for my colleagues on that. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be thus modified. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I appreciate the gentleman's willingness to do that, I, but I, I want to underscore this point. I think we need to look at this, but I would hope that we, we show equal scrutiny to the uh, so-called skeptics of uh, climate change research. We've got abundant data. Uh, I believe on ocean acidification, global overheating, uh, that suggests there, that the, uh, the bulk of the data is solid, the phenomenon is real, and we need to take action. But I think actually adding uh, a level of analysis of the data may help put this uh, uh, issue to bed, and we can get back to uh, the true uh, 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 overall findings. And with that, I yield back. Thank, gentlemen. Thank the gentleman for uh, removal of that uh, passage of concern. Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I support uh, uh, the gentleman's amendment, and uh, I support all sound science on climate change. This amendment's in line with the resolution that I introduced and we passed sometime last year. Uh, we I introduced it and we debated. I'm just told it didn't pass. Uh, they didn't see the good judgment in it, I guess. Uh, use of sound science in the climate debate, but that's what the gentleman is, is suggesting here, and I certainly support that amendment and any other amendment along that line. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Ms. Woolsey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, climate change clearly is one of the most serious threats that our nation and our planet is facing. Uh, uh, and Mr. Sensenbrenner's uh, amendment would instruct NASA to conduct a report that it has already written. Uh, I, I really worry that uh, and would speculate this amendment might be mischievous in its motives, uh, hoping to create a paper trail among NASA scientists that all outside critics can get through FOIA and use selectively like the CRU emails to further inflame passion on climate science. Uh, 
I, I fear this would only further the burden already harassing NASA climate scientists. I, I oppose uh, this amendment. Uh, I see it as uh, putting a burden on NASA that's already transparent on its data and its methods. Uh, so um, I just think we're going nowhere with this but backwards. Uh, we ought to be going forward. We can't continue to slow down uh, what we need to be dealing with uh, right now, and that's uh, climate uh, change and the, res the effects of what it's having on our planet. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Woolsey. Anyone else like to miss? Uh, miss I'm sorry. Argument number. Mr. Three. Robacher. Argument is. number three, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> without. Uh, all right, that's all right, without, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, let me just note that I remember the hearings that we had here, in which uh, investigated whether or not uh, Mr. Hansen uh, from NASA, who was the guru of global warming for NASA, uh, had been censored or in some way uh, restricted uh, in, in, a, in an objectionable way uh, when the last administration required that he put at the bottom of his papers uh, that had not been approved by, other, by, by NASA as a whole, that this was his opinion. Uh, and that was it, that saying, we were just requiring a, uh, uh, that type of disclaimer that, uh, that the, all of NASA did not endorse his findings. Uh, we had a hearing to determine whether that was an act of, uh, of, of censorship or if that was an act of, uh, that undermined uh, uh, the honesty of scientific research. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, okay, we, we heard that. We heard the hearing and uh, heard what, what the charges were. That charge was nothing as compared to what we've seen from uh, about this, this whole crisis uh, on information from East Anglia and the, re and the American researchers that have been tied in uh, to global warming and the indication uh, that uh, through these intercepted emails that there's been dramatic fraud that has taken place. There's been the suppression of information by these very same people and we have not had one hearing on that that I remember. Has the Science Committee had a hearing on this? We, have, we didn't have a hearing on, on whether or not there should be a loan guarantee that we're now relying upon. Uh, uh, and now we're not, we didn't have a hearing on, on this as well. Mr. Chairman, these are very significant issues. And uh, uh, to the degree that we paid any attention to Mr. Hansen's complaint that he was uh, that he was required to have a disclaimer at the bottom of his documents as compared to the information that we have now about the wholesale uh, doctoring of information uh, by, research, by global warming researchers, people who are operating with government funds, uh, this is a disgrace. We should, we're not doing our job here if we haven't had a hearing on this, and we haven't. And uh, that's why I think Mr. Sensenbrenner needs to have this passed in order to emphasize that this is a, is a major issue that should not just be shrug our shoulders and say, well, we're going to move on now, even though there hasn't been any real investigation of the issue. So uh, I would support this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. I recognize myself. Um, uh, Mr. Hall has volunteered to give you a hearing next year if, uh, if that all things work out. Um, <laughs> Let me, uh, let, let me, just for the record, let me say this. NASA already makes all of its data and modeling available to the public. Anyone can go look at it via the Internet. NASA scientists already have a 37-page article that goes into careful detail about how they model climate data and, dis and discusses differences with the CRU. That article is in a draft form and out for peer review, but it is available to anyone to read on the NASA website. Now, with that said, um, uh, we have over 30 amendments today that, that deal with the core of NASA. Uh, we could talk a great deal about climate change. I think this is it's important, but a little off message here. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Baird has made a, a, a worthwhile suggestion to Mr. Sensenbrenner, uh, who in his normal jovial way uh, accepted. And so um, 
Uh, I think that we should take this rare moment and celebrate it and, um, and, and support uh, the modified Central Center Amendment. Is there further discussion? M Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I did recognize that you invited me not to speak. Um, the Oversight Subcommittee would gladly have held a hearing uh, had any of this been within the United States. Uh, this is in East Anglia, which is beyond the subpoena power of our subcommittee. We cannot require documents to be produced from East Anglia. We cannot require witnesses to attend hearings and give testimony from East Anglia. Uh, but we have all seen in the last few days uh, just what selective editing can do to the truth, how badly it could mangle it. If there, if there had not been a complete videotape of Shirley Sherrod's complete uh, sp uh, speech to the NAACP in Georgia, she would have been forever tarred, her, assassin her, her character forever, uh, her reputation forever ruined. Uh, as a racist when, in fact, she was telling a story of racial reconciliation that I can tell you as a southerner uh, has happened on both sides by whites and by African Americans over the last generation or two. What happened with respect to the, to the uh, emails in East Anglia is that a group of emails that were intended to be private, that were unguarded, uh, were stolen and selectively edited. And we have no idea what, what the total picture looked like. And it is beyond our subpoena power to find out. But there have been three inquiries in in the United Kingdom, uh, which is not exactly a developing uh, a third world country. Uh, our sister committee, the equivalent committee of this one, the Science and Technology Committee of the House of Commons, uh, did a full investigation and, and concluded that all of the findings of the CRU are credible, uh, that there was no subversion of the peer review process, and that there was no reason to doubt any of the findings of the CRU with respect to climate change. There was a second panel uh, by the Royal Society, which is the equivalent of our National Academy of Sciences, um, uh, chaired by Lord Oxborough, uh, which reached the same conclusion. There was no evidence of any deliberate scientific uh, malpractice or misrepresentation that the findings of the CRU with respect to climate change were credible. Uh, and the University of East Anglia itself conducted a review of all of the information, all of the emails, all of what was done by that, uh, by that unit, by that research unit, um, and concluded that the CRU had not, in fact, blocked access to any raw data or tampered with it in any way. They had not manipulated data to, to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, that there was no reason to think that the work of the CRU could not be relied upon, uh, was unreliable, that it, was, that it could be trusted. Uh, and that, that any uncertainties with respect to the CRU's uh, work were probably applicable to any scientist doing any kind of research anywhere. Uh, so uh, it, it does help this amendment substantially that it takes out a finding that for which there is no evidence, no credible evidence. Uh, I still think that uh, I, I understand that, that the committee will support this amendment, uh, but it is redundant. It is better that it's uh, just redundant rather than factually incorrect and redundant, uh, but it is still redundant because NASA is already doing this and doing it in a very public way. And NASA's, and, and believe me, I'm very critical of NASA. I'm completely willing to be critical of NASA, uh, as everyone on this committee knows. Uh, but with respect to their climate data, uh, it has been open. It has been transparent. It is on the Internet. You can see it. Uh, you can subject it. Uh, it is subject to peer review. I Thank you, Mr. Back. Miller, for that clarification. Mr. There's Chairman. no further discussion. Oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, we go to this side, uh, uh, Dr. Bartlett. I'd just like to note that Mr. Miller may indeed be right, but still there is a, there are a very large number of people out there who have some concerns about the credibility of these data. This amendment certainly does no harm. All we're doing is asking NASA to make sure, to make sure of the validity of this data. I can't see any any downside to, to voting this, uh, uh, approving this amendment. I see a large upside in the, that will confirm to those who, who believe that the data is, is, is not adulterated, that it in fact is not adulterated. How can there be a downside to this? I yield back. There's no further questions or, or uh, Mr. discussion? Chairman? 
I, see, I, I believe Mrs. Um, Woolsey has spoken earlier, but I think probably Ms. Johnson we would like to me? yield to you. Yes, I'll yield. Okay. Thank you. I would just <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, some of us would like to consider our vote on this. So could we have a vote? Could we roll the vote? You want a roll call vote? Yes. Could we have yes. a show of hands vote since there's a lot of folks that would have to come in for that? Oh, we're not going to have any roll call votes on well, anything? Well, we, we may. I mean, if it, later. We'll, we'll have a roll call vote end. anytime anybody wants to. Oh, it, I'm it, not calling for it now. I'm calling for it when you. I'm suggesting we're rolling the votes. I, that's what no, I'm oh, no, we're going to take the we're going to take the amendments as we. Oh, as then as I'll forward. no, no, no. Thank we you. We can have a we. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I will lose on that one. So no. <laughs> I, no use throwing myself on the, my sword on that one. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's no further discussion on the amendment, then um, then um, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. And no's noted, uh, but the ayes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Agreed to, excuse me, agreed to. All right, the third of 30-something uh, amendments um, is uh, on the roster is offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Robacher. Are you ready to proceed? Considering the, uh, considering the vote that prior to this vote, uh, I will withdraw my amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robacher. Um, uh, the next amendment on the roster is also an amendment by Mr. Robacher from California. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, this is uh, a bit different because it, uh, uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 046, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Robacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered. Uh, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, there is a difference between what uh, NASA proposed and what uh, uh, the bill before us proposes in terms of spending for uh, uh, the development of commercial cargo. And uh, uh, again, I know that uh, this may scientifically prove that there are snowballs in hell, but I am supporting the administration's request uh, and a champion of uh, President Obama's policy on uh, <laughs> development of, uh, uh, of commercial cargo alternatives. And uh, I think that uh, what we, uh, again, what we've done um, in our efforts is uh, an alternative to what NASA uh, is officially requesting. Uh, and if we have uh, you know, if we're going to this loan guarantee program, which is, might, might be something I might support in the, uh, after we know more about it, um, I, I think that we should not go in that direction until at least we've had hearings on that and determine the efficacy of that approach. So um, what I am suggesting then is that we uh, go with what, the, uh, what NASA and the President uh, has recommended, which will ensure that at least in the commercial cargo part of uh, uh, of our space program, uh, if we're not going to if we're not going to have a robust human space transportation uh, system, uh, 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 human system in the pri for the private sector, at least we could have a private sector uh, system that uh, is robust in terms of providing cargo transportation. Uh, let me note that uh, uh, this. Um, uh, proposal uh, is not really uh, uh, something that we are destroying. The, 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 we're just moving around some money here. The, the, the effort for Constellation and, and, and what your budget has, uh, what we're voting on today, will not give us full funding anyway for what we need in, to accomplish uh, uh, the goal that's been stated here of having a government-run system. Well, at least if we do this, we, this will provide the funds that are necessary to have a private sector alternative to that. And we've seen investment and a great deal of success in Falcon 9, and, and we also have uh, Delta, the Delta system and the Atlas system available to us uh, and uh, uh, with some modifications, which this would, uh, uh, would help out. They could actually do more than cargo. They could actually start heading even... Uh, in the direction of, of human uh, transportation, 
But this amendment is focused on the commercial end. We should have, if we can't have a robust uh, human uh, space flight endeavor for the private sector and let the private sector do that, at least we could make sure the private sector can take care of some of the commercial cargo uh, needs for our space program. And that's what uh, my amendment would do. Thank you. Thank you, Comrade Robacher, and I've been informed that President Obama thanks you. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Edwards is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I plan to um, oppose the gentleman's amendment. Under the uh, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Demonstration Project, NASA's helping industry develop and demonstrate cargo space transportation capabilities. $500 million was allocated to the multi-year COTS pro demonstration program, and of that amount, $14 million was to be provided in fiscal year 11. However, the FY11 budget request instead includes $312 million uh, for commercial cargo development efforts. That amount represents an increase in the COTS program of over 62 percent relative to the original COTS funding commitment, which is extraordinary in this uh, time. During the committee's review of NASA's budget request, committee staff asked the reason for the $312 million increase. Here's what NASA said. $288 million would be an augmentation to the current COTS agreements for additional milestones that NASA would like to add to the program to provide additional capabilities or tests. $14 million would be for currently negotiated milestones expected to be completed in fisc fiscal year 2011, part of the original 500 million COTS funding commitment. 10 million would be for program operations for the commercial crew and cargo office at Johnson Space Center in fiscal year 2011. NASA also confirmed that neither SpaceX nor Orbital, Orbital the two COTS program participants, requested the additional funding of $288 million. And both they and NASA say that the increased funding is not required to meet planned demonstration flight milestones. The $14 million, uh, for, million dollars for currently negotiated milestones is expected to be completed in fiscal year 2011 and authorized in this bill for fiscal year 2011. We include funding for the commercial office at JSC as part of the $50 million for the commercial activities in the bill. But this environment of tight budgets where we have to make tough choices, the bill chooses not to add significant additional funding to a program that's been progressing satisfactorily since uh, 2006 and doesn't need it to meet its milestones. As I know Mr. Warbacher understands, we can't do it all. And when budgets are tight, some of the nice-to-haves need to be deferred in order to use scarce resources for other programs in greater need of, of resources. I urge my colleagues to oppose the amendment. And I'd say to Mr. Warbacher, you know, if I had had my way, we'd probably had zero. Um, in, in this program, and so and the administration came out in one direction. We've struck what I think is an appropriate balance Would in the, the lady, uh, uh, And with that, question? I yield. Would the gentlelady yield for a question? Yes. Um, the money that we're talking about, this $312 million, if it's not spent for the development of commercial, on a commercial alternative uh, and providing that incentive, uh, where do you think the money will be spent? And if the money is spent where, where it will go, will that provide us anything that will work? Uh, I'm suggesting that the money being spent here will end up providing us with commercial capability, but the money, if the $112 million isn't spent here, will it not just go into a program that even by the current plan will not come to fruition and not provide us any added capability. Well, if I could reclaim my uh, time, we have, a, we have a really balanced program and a balanced uh, budget. I mean, the fact is that um, even the commercial enterprises that are identified here didn't ask for the money. Um, and so it seems to me, as we're trying to figure out ways in which we can create balance throughout uh, the agency and the authorization and, you know, support this sort of emerging development of a commercial space flight uh, uh, cargo capacity um, that this budget and the authorization um, herein, I think, really reflects that and at the same time um, enables uh, NASA to move forward in a way that's responsible. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I think you made a good point that if that if we took a, 
a vote with all or none, we would have a very uh, – there are strong feelings both ways, and this was an attempt to try to make that balance. If there's no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. Those opposed, no. No. The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida. Mr. Grayson, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 081, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, this bill provides for $500 million in government support to companies with no revenue, no profit, virtually no capital, no customers, and no product. This is the epitome of socialism and corporate welfare. I, this amendment has one purpose and one purpose only, to strike the $500 million that we're seeking to give to people who haven't even asked for it so that they can supposedly develop a capability that the government already has. Uh, specifically, uh, this is an amendment that eliminates the subsidy in this bill uh, that provides for these commercial entities to get $500 million. It raises the question of why we are trying in the first place to turn over an existing functioning, well-functioning program that uses government ent entities and government um, resources to put men in space. And we're trying to turn that over to commercial entities for what? So that we can hand them $500 million? Almost every large NASA contract is a cost reimbursement contract. Presumably, if one of these entities ever does develop the ability to put men in space, NASA will give them a cost reimbursement contract. A cost reimbursement contract pays the contractor a fee and then invites the contractor so to submit invoices for its expenses. It's basically a huge expense account. So any one of these companies that actually does get to the point where they can put men in space will in all likelihood get a cost reimbursement contract from NASA. And then on top of that, we're supposed to be giving them under this bill $500 million in loans. For what? Why are we doing this? I think that this is a terrible waste. I think that it, it, if anybody here is serious at all about the idea that we should be cutting the deficit, this is a good place to start. Why hand $500 million of federal resources to companies that don't need it, haven't asked for it, don't want it, and will provide in all likelihood nothing for it? That's why I propose this amendment. I yield back. Would anyone else like to be heard on the amendment? Ms. Robacher is uh, recognized. Well, again, we're at a real crossroads here, and uh, let me just note, uh, I think America is a better country because we have United Airlines and American Airlines and uh, uh, private companies that actually provide transportation through the air, uh, although 100 years ago it seemed like that would be a totally impossible dream. Uh, we're on the, you know, we're basically, we reach a threshold now technologically where we can have commercial space endeavors, but all along, as we know, uh, in the development of, of uh, private industries and, and, and taking technologies and taking it in the private sector, and uh, uh, there has, there's never been a, a uh, you might say, a, uh, a pristine free enterprise approach, and there has been some government involvement, and the degree is whether or not some of us believe in some government involvement versus some people don't believe there should be any private sector involvement at all. And uh, I, I respect the notion that the government should run everything. I respect the notion that the businesses that are now run in the private sector, that people should be out there should be government employees. If people actually believe that that's the best approach to running uh, enterprises, and uh, uh, that's great. I don't agree with that. I don't think the American people agree with that as well. I think the American people are very supportive of efforts to try to get uh, uh, private individuals and entrepreneurs and, and commercial enterprise involved in what has basically been a government-run operation in terms of space transportation. And uh, uh, this, what this bill does is, and again, I would agree with the gentleman on one thing, we haven't had the hearings necessary to talk about the efficacy of the, of the loan program. But that doesn't mean that, that we are just basically now going to uh, take the steps of, uh, uh, that would just totally undermine all of the different approaches 
to commercial space because that's what we're hearing today. We're hearing today that it's not good just to have the grant, a grant program, it's not good to have, and so, and now it's not good to have a loan guarantee program. And what we're really saying here is what we're really hearing here is that their government should run all of the space business in the future. That we're, that's what, that's what, you know, we're making that determination. I would suggest that by taking uh, uh, this money and providing, at least for loan guarantees, I would have had it even uh, uh, more direct than that, uh, that it's a wise use of our money, and, that, and apparently NASA and the administration agreed with that, as compared by putting the same amount of money, this $312 million, uh, into the exploration program uh, that we're going to be building a government system that the money that's being provided won't even guarantee that we have that system because so we're spending we're taking it from loan guarantee program for commercial enterprise and giving it to part of our budget that will produce probably nothing no capabilities because we're underfunded it's underfunded to the point that we know we're not going to be able to accomplish our mission with it so uh, I would suggest that the uh, 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 the gentleman's uh, uh, amendment, uh, I, I, I certainly appreciate people with, with different uh, philosophical approaches to what uh, government should do and what it shouldn't do, but this will be the uh, coffin, the, the nail in the coffin uh, for commercial space if we continue down the path that we seem to be going today. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Giffords is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also will respectively respectfully oppose the, the gentleman's amendment. And again, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about the balance in this bill and really trying to ensure that we have a, a national human spaceflight program that, that is um, um, NASA-led and that we're also trying to augment and promote the future of commercial space. And the way that, that this provision is written, the administrator is not going to provide loans or any loan going guarantees to, to any companies um, unless among a whole series of conditions are met, and they include the administrator determining that there's a reasonable prospect of repayment of the principal and interest by the borrower, and also that the amount of the obligation when combined with the amounts available to the borrower from other sources is actually sufficient to carry out the total development cost. And finally, that the administrator shall charge fees sufficient to cover the cost of administrating the program. In contrast to the direct funding that the administration takes in their tax, this bill exposes the taxpayer, I believe, to minimum cost and minimum risk, but allows the amount of federal funding allocated for the loan guarantees to potentially leverage a significantly greater amount of money. Um, how much more will be set by OMB? Well, who will have the chance to assess the risk involved with the loan guarantee programs? And since OMB is providing such large amounts to commercial providers in the President's request, I have to assume that they consider the risk to be low, so they should be willing to provide a rate that allows a large amount of leverage from the available funding. But of course, that's for OMB to determine, not for us. Um, also, would, would just like to note that the gentleman's amendment actually cuts into NASA's budget, and I, I don't think that's the intent of, of the committee. Uh, in fact, you know, if I'd been the president, I would have doubled NASA's budget, frankly. I mean, we, we don't have that much resources. I want to make sure that we keep all the dollars on the table that we do, that we have. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not to my right, to my left, Mr. Garamendi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief with this. Uh, I support the amendment that is proposed. I also note that the guarantee as written here would require that the private entrepreneur come up with 25 percent of the money and 75 percent would be the, uh, the federal uh, loan guarantee. I just think that we do have a program. I agree with all that Mr. Grayson said about uh, duplication. We're talking about companies that have really no track record at all receiving up to half a billion dollars of uh, federal loan guarantee. Perhaps they can pay it back, but uh, we're looking at 75 percent of the money being the government's share here, and I think we just be better off saying no and moving on. Is there further discussion on this issue? I'm sure there'll be further discussion as we go through <laughs> down the uh, one of the amendments. But in terms of this amendment, if no, I, uh, then um, uh, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. 
No. No. no. Uh, have it. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Uh, a recorded vote has been asked. Uh, the clerk will record the vote. Pull the vote. Chairman Gordon. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Woolsey. Ms. Woolsey votes no. Mr. Wu. Mr. Baird. Mr. Baird votes no. Mr. Miller. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Carnahan votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Dahlkepper. Yes. Ms. Dahlkepper votes aye. Mr. Grayson. Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Ms. Cosmas. No. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes no. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roy Barker. Mr. Roy Barker votes no. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes no. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Ehlers votes no. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas votes no. Mrs. Biggert. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes no. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Mr. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Wu votes no. No. Ms. Edwards votes no. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move from a no to a yes.
Mr. Chairman, six members vote aye and 23 members vote no. The ayes have it. The amendment is not, I mean, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Um, and the next amendment on the roster is the amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Mr. Chairman, thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 040, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered, I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's fair to say that all the uh, discussion around amendments for today's bill uh, focus on our attempts to find a balance in what we're proposing to do. That is to say, we want to ensure that we maintain America's leadership with a NASA-led vehicle, but we are looking for opportunities to uh, increase the use of innovation and, and uh, entrepreneurship. And this amendment proposes to do just that by suggesting we authorize and fund from within the exploration budget a flagship technology demonstration program. This would be based at the jo Johnson Space Center and at the Kennedy Space Center. Demonstration missions would be launched from Kennedy Space Center and utilize the expertise and the workforce there, which has been my number one priority uh, in the 19 months that I've been serving here. The Augustine Commission, as well as many previous commissions and studies, have identified the need to develop these technologies, such as an on-orbit refueling, in-site resource util utilization, life support systems, and new propulsion methods in order to enable human spaceflight below low Earth orbit, beyond low Earth orbit, orbit excuse me, beyond low Earth orbit. Technology such as on-orbit fueling has the potential to significantly improve the performance of heavy lift vehicles while achieving appreciably lower total life cycle costs. The ability to utilize the resources at the destinations we intend to visit is also essential to conducting successful long-duration exploration missions. The need to develop and prove these types of technologies is fundamental to the successful execution of an exploration program. My amendment proposes to fund this program at the same levels already approved by the Senate authorizers and appropriators in order to spur the development of these critical technologies. I urge you to support my amendment and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Cosmos. And Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I oppose this amendment. We've worked very hard to ensure that there's a follow-on program to the sh space uh, shuttle that would assure the U.S. has a vibrant space exploration program. General Lady's amendment will likely take money away from the task of developing the next generation of launch vehicles so we can reduce the gap as soon as possible. I think some of her proposed technology demonstrations would be useful, but I don't believe most of us are willing to take money from the development of exploration vehicles to do that at this time. We do oppose the amendment. Is there further discussion? Um, Mr. Robacher is recognized. Um, well, I'm glad to see <clears throat> that there are some people here who are uh, looking to build the future rather than trying to just get by uh, with today's capabilities and what uh, uh, the, the lady from Florida is suggesting uh, as, a, as a priority for this budget is, some, is, is again, very future-oriented and uh, uh, as uh, compared to simply spending money on a uh, system that uh, will not, uh, well, let's put it this way, it's based on, on, on old, old concepts. She's taking money from, from uh, part of the budget based on old concepts and taking and trying to put the put that money into developing new technologies and new ways uh, uh, to approach space exploration and space transportation and it's uh, I happen to believe and we've had to talk about commercial now I happen to believe commercial is a way to go but certainly we should be talking about new technologies as the way to go and one of the big problems with the Constellation program and the Aries system uh, and spending money simply in, in that program was that it was not developing new technology. And the lady is, and the money that's being funded in this bill will not even lead to the completion of that program. So at least what the lady is proposing is that we take money uh, that is being spent in a way that will not lead to the, the completion of any project 
and at least let's uh, start developing these new technologies that will give us new capabilities uh, for uh, better approaches to space uh, transportation. And uh, I would not be supporting it if it, uh, uh, if it just added more money, but I believe this is uh, now we're actually shifting money away from something that is less creative and will give less benefit in the end to, to America than developing these new uh, concepts of uh, space transportation like refueling, which I believe, and I agree with the lady, would, uh, will open up a whole new uh, a world or a whole new universe of, of exploration uh, for humankind uh, if we perfect that approach rather than just relying on the old approach, which is just building bigger rockets, bigger behemoths to launch into the air. Well, this will give us a, a, perhaps the same capability as building some big constellation rocket by uh, putting money into developing a system of refueling and other type of technologies that will expand our capabilities in a new way rather than relying on the old ways of approaching space transportation. So I would uh, ask my colleagues to uh, join me in supporting this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. Let me point out that um, this bill does provide $5 billion over the next five years for new technologies. Because we, you know, and I certainly agree with you that we want to look at the, for those new technologies. Um, but I can't agree uh, that this does not add additional expense. It actually adds $2 billion uh, to uh, the program. Uh, or it will uh, pretty much gut much of the exploration program, as, as uh, Mr. Hall has pointed out. And so for that, even though I, I, I am sympathetic to it in, you know, in, a, in, a, in a world with additional resources, I'm afraid that we can't afford it now. Is there further discussion? If no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. 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 The noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 065, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Lujan of New Mexico. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Again, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The Commercial Reusable Suborbital Research Program at NASA, known as CRUISER, is designed to allow students, businesses, and researchers to fly experiments on board commercial suborbital space vehicles. The goal of the program is to facilitate access to near space by NASA sponsored researchers, engineers, technologists, and educators. These flights provide researchers access to microgravity environments, which is far less costly than sending experiments into the International Space Station. The President's budget request for NASA includes $15 million a year for the cruiser program for 2011 through 2015. However, the original text of this bill only authorizes $1 million a year for cruiser from the Space Technology Authorization for 2011 and 2012. My amendment would strike the $1 million annual authorization for the cruiser program for 2011 and 2012, removing the $1 million limit and leaving allocation of funding for cruiser to the direction of the NASA Administrator. This is not a new authorization, nor does it take away funding from any other authorizations in the bill. My amendment also clarifies management and other requirements of the program, which are consistent with critical suborbital science missions. My home state of New Mexico is currently reaping the economic benefits of commercial suborbital spaceflight through our Spaceport America facility near Las Cruces. About 500 New Mexicans are now on the job, creating the first commercial spaceport in the world. Another 300 new jobs are expected this year. New Mexico's spaceport is inspiring students to study math and science and pursue careers in STEM fields, which will develop our future economy. Investments in programs like Cruiser and in public-private partnerships within NASA to support and develop a suborbital spaceflight will ensure that America continues to be a global leader in the space technology for the 21st century. With that, Mr. Chairman, I urge my colleagues to support this amendment. Thank you for your consideration, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Lujan, for uh, a, uh, another good amendment. Does Mr. Uh, Hall wish to be recognized? I do. Oh, uh, I would like to be. Mr. Hall. I don't have to be. Mr. Hall is recognized. I, I, I was going to whisper to you that I support his amendment. Uh, I do plan to support the gentleman's amendment. Uh, I have some talented young guys in my hometown of Rockwall, Texas. It's, 
It's the smallest county in Texas out of 254 counties. I hate to admit that anything small, but right there in that small, <laughs> small county that operate out of a little place called Caddo Mills Airport, they have a company called Armadillo Aerospace, and I attended a, a celebration for them and a recognition for them here. Didn't know where I was going, didn't know what I was going to say when I got there, but NASA had a prize program, and they had won a part of the prize program and received a half a million dollars. And I've seen a video of some of their work. I hope to get out there and see them in person one of these days, but they're doing some very interesting things and have some good ideas for commercial reusable uh, suborbital flight vehicles. I've had some concerns with aspects of the program, but I think Mr. Lujan's amendments has improved the program and it's likely to get help, likely to help some of these bright young people make good contributions to the scientific research. I make no, uh, no recommendations for my colleagues. They can vote the way they see fit. They're going to anyway, but for me, I'm going to support Mr. Lujan's amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. I think Mr. Lujan probably thanks you. Um, <laughs> if there's no further discussion on the amendment, uh, oh, Ms. Cosmas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, very quickly, I want to speak in support of this amendment. The suborbital cruiser program obviously provides many opportunities for NASA, university or private researchers, tourists and other federal agencies. Uh, the thing that I have identified as my number one priority also might be affected here as these uh, opportunities can use the shuttle landing strip and other facilities at Kennedy Space Center and therefore uh, my workforce and the expertise that they have may be put to good use through the uh, support of this program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cosmas. Does anyone else wish to be heard? If, if not, then the vote appear, uh, occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from, from Georgia, Dr. Brown. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 001, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was excited to hear you as you uh, made your opening remarks about being fiscally responsible. And I want to thank you, Ranking Member Hall, Chairman, Chairwoman Gifford, and Congressman Olson, along with the staff, for all of y'all's hard work in producing this bipartisan bill that will allow NASA to refocus its core mission in a fiscally responsible way. I know this has not been an easy task and many difficult decisions had to be made. While I believe this bill is a good faith effort towards a balanced approach and addresses the right priorities, I'm still concerned with the heavy burden of debt and the huge deficits looming before us. Therefore, I offer my amendment today that would authorize these programs for three years instead of five years, as the current language does. Again, I appreciate by the strong bipartisan effort in developing this bill, and I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Brown. I want to excite you some more in that I uh, support your amendment. Um, but I also hope, uh, and part of that is because I hope in three years, uh, that there will be more money available, that we will have a better economy, and that we will be able to carry out things that Ms. Cosmas, Mr. Mr. Robacher, and other good amendments that have been before us. Mr. Chairman, would you yield? Uh, certainly, Dr. Brown. Uh, I'm excited that you accept my amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to be very quiet over here and let Mr. Robacher talk, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you, and I agree with you, and I associate myself with your last remarks about You're always a constructive money, so part of Thank this. you so much, sir. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, I, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 003, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, Mr. Chairman, conspicuously absent from this legislation is any mention of the Constellation Program. While that might suit the prerogative of the administration, it is not consistent with the intent of this Congress or this committee. 
Congress has repeatedly affirmed its support for the Constellation Program through the previous authorization bills and by the sentiments expressed by members on both sides of the aisle. I'm not here to defend NASA's mismanagement of its resources. Without question, budgetary constraints force us to reevaluate how each program has been managed, but the wholesale elimination of Constellation will have detrimental effects on our struggling economy, set back our space program several years, and result in significant termination costs while surrendering the progress that has been made in recent years. This amendment makes it clear that this committee and this Congress continue to support the Constellation program. Now, what I'm here to say is, is that I'm afraid that the omission of the word constellation in the text of this bill will be interpreted by the administration as saying that we are going back on what we have previously stated in statements and in authorization legislation that has been previously passed. And all this amendment does is to insert the words constellation program and after support for. So this makes it clear that this is not a 180 by the committee. It is not a 180 by the Congress. And what we should be doing here if we need to redirect and reprogram money is to do it in the context of legislation uh, that has been around for more than 20 or 48 hours and open for amendment uh, for only 24 hours. Uh, this is a big program. We spent $10 billion on it, and we do need to spend a little bit more time before either withdrawing support for Constellation or allowing the administration to say, well, since Congress didn't mention Constellation uh, as they have in the past, I guess they have drawn back on it. Uh, there's no fiscal effect on this. This basically transfers the burden to NASA to come up here and to be a little bit more detailed on why they're doing this. Uh, uh, given the previous support and previous comments by members of this committee, I would strongly urge members to adopt this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Let me point out that there have been a numerous hearings, I think 19 hearings on this program. Um, this is not the Constellation program that was envisioned uh, some time back, um, simply because we simply do not have the money. And as, as Dr. Brown has pointed out, we're trying to live within our budget. This is a, this is a new program. And let me also point out, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this committee has never named a, uh, a program. Uh, that's up to NASA. And so I would say that we should continue uh, with that, and it's up to NASA to name the name, I'm more interested in the content. This is, this, this is a content that has provided good, uh, a good balance, and I would suggest that we uh, continue and reject the, um, the uh, gentleman's amendment. Is there further discussion? If not, yes, I'd, I'd, uh, Mr. Hall recognizes. I'd like to yield to Mr. Or, uh, Mr. Uh, Sensenbrenner. Sensenbrenner, if he wants uh, to say I a word. I thank the gentleman for yielding. We're not naming this program. We're using the program that NASA named. Uh, I fully agree that NASA has the prerogative to name programs. You know, we shouldn't be uh, saying that this is the Jim Sensenbrenner program or the Bart Gordon program and making monuments to ourselves. But I'm just referring to NASA's own terminology in this uh, amendment. This is very clear. You know, are we going to go back on the support for this program or are we not? And all this does is insert NASA's name in the list of things that we support. I thank the gentleman for yielding and yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me take up my time if I might. Uh, we do name uh, things after people and after programs. Uh, there's a certain chairman of a science committee that uh, I'm going to name the Barton arpa -E, uh, <laughs> Foundation uh, to if I live and if I'm here next year. Uh, and I don't think it hurts to address or tip our hat to the word constellation because that's been the battle cry of all of us, that to keep, keep constellation and build on it, change whatever changes we had to make on it, but make it a NASA program rather than loaning some bunch of people some money, not knowing if they're going to pay it back, and then they're going to charge the hell out of us for flying in one of the seats. Uh, not ever knowing that we'll ever get our money back. We could call it constellation light or... Uh, anything else, but uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. It's a simple amendment that reaffirms Congress' support for the Constellation program. 
Constellation program has been a rallying cry for thousands of aerospace workers and former astronauts. The former astronauts came here, used the word constellation time and again, and uh, Cornyn and uh, Armstrong Stafford. And it means a lot to those old heroes of the past who came here before this committee to, to take on the striking of a line through the word constellation that brought us here, that spawned this hearing. Uh, while this bill makes some important updates to the original Constellation program, it retains the key elements and focus of that vision. And that's what it is. It's a vision. I think it's important that we recognize as a Congress the legacy of this program. I think that the gentleman's amendment does precisely that. I urge the passage of it, and I think you're going to hear from a lot of the old astronauts if we don't put Constellation back at least into this program somewhere. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Let me just sort of conclude. We've got votes going on. Uh, I was a supporter of Constellation, uh, but if we're going to call it Constellation, we need to fund it like Constellation. This program is not being funded like Constellation. This is, uh, this is when you read the bill, uh, this clearly is a hybrid with a lot of the Constellation uh, investments that's been made, but it's something different. Once again, I think uh, this committee has never uh, named a program it's up to NASA. I, I, I think that Mr. Hall has a good idea of changing that precedent next year, and I would welcome him to do that in, in the, in the, the uh, context of what he was talking about. But he, we're here today, and so if there's no further discussion, uh, then um, uh, those in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Uh, I think the... Well, we're, uh, I, I want to do the right thing here. Let's see. What, 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 let's, have, let's have a show of hands. Let's just. Well, let's, let's, have, let's have a show of hands. Uh, if those that are favor say aye. Uh, opposed, raise your hand. The the uh, nose uh, have it, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I demand a recorded vote. You can get it. Um, you're bringing them back. So the clerk will record the vote. Chairman Call Gordon. Them. Nope. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Miss Johnson. Miss Woolsey. No. Miss Woolsey votes no. Mr. Wu. No. Mr. Wu votes no. Mr. Baird. Mr. Barrett votes no. Mr. Miller. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes no. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. No. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Rothman. No. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Matheson. No. Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. No. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. No. Mr. Carnahan votes no. Mr. Hill. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Wilson. Mrs. Dahlkepper. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes no. Mr. Grayson. No. Mr. Grayson votes no. Mrs. Cosmas. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Sensenbrenner votes aye. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roybacher. Mr. Roybacher votes no. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes aye. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Ehlers votes aye. Mr. Lucas. Mr. Lucas votes aye. Mrs. Biggert. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes aye. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes aye. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes aye. Mr. Brown. Aye. Mr. Brown votes aye. Mr. Olson. Aye. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. Miller votes no. 
Ms. Mr. Lipinski votes no. Mr. Chairman, 10 members vote aye and 19 members vote no. As when we come back, we'll proceed with Mr. Olson's amendment. Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, Mr. Do Ms. Edwards. A, do you have a time that we're, we'll come back? Do you have a specific time? Well, yeah, okay, let's do this. No, I mean, I'm sure people would like to go to their offices, uh, but uh, I would like to get started 10 minutes after the last vote. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gordon. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 034, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Olson of Texas. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, one of the strengths of our bill is that it seeks to maximize development of current investments in technology, including the Orion crew capsule and the Ares-1 launch vehicle. Unrecognized in our bill is the great progress being made in the spacesuit technology as well. The process of producing a new spacesuit in accordance with strict NASA oversight for safety and compatibility is well underway. My amendment would recognize those efforts in space, de space suit development and life support technology by including them in the restructured exploration program. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Olson, for a good amendment. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I rise in strong support of his amendment. It's a minor clarification to Section 202, the restructured exploration program. It simply directs NASA to include spacesuit development and related life support technology among the systems it should attempt to bring forward to the new restructured exploration program. Section 202 calls out Ares-1 and the Orion crew vehicle. This amendment simply adds another of the constellation-related technologies to be applied to the new crew transportation system. There's no additional cost. There's no cost associated with this amendment. It's a good provision. I urge all members to support it. If there's no further discussion, the vote is on the amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida. Ms. Cosmas, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will, will report the amendment. <clears throat> amendment number 041, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the continued and expedited development of NASA-led heavy lift vehicle is critical to us for maintaining America's international leadership in space exploration. And I think uh, it's safe to say the opinion of the members of this committee, it's also integral to, to this particular piece of legislation. What my amendment does is to support and hasten that development by utilizing the investments we've already made by both the Air Force and other government entities, as well as by increasing the competition to ensure that the use of NASA funding is as efficient and effective as possible. As currently written, the bill before us blocks out the use of many technologies in which the federal government has already invested. This amendment would allow NASA to consider the joint use of propulsion systems across civil, military, and commercial vehicles, which would enable efficiencies in production and in cost. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment in order to ensure robust competition that will maximize federal investments in the development of a heavy lift vehicle. And I yield back my time. Is there further discussion? 
Uh, let me just point out that we share the same uh, objective of getting uh, to heavy lift as soon as possible. Uh, but once again, we want to do it within the resources of NASA. My, my concern is that uh, providing or this joint effort of civil uh, national security uh, commercial has never been done, at least in this area, and this thing it could slow us down. Where we have seen it uh, uh, being uh, done is in the INPOS program that wound up being an enormous waste of money, uh, and I'm afraid demonstrated that sometimes the one-size-fit-all approach does not work. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman, since you mentioned Mr. Hall. that, let me uh, – I'm – Sure, the gentle lady has the best intentions with this amendment, but I'm not sure to understand what she's trying to do. Uh, we want NASA to move forward with their design and development work. Uh, I guess I'd have to ask the gentle lady to explain what she's trying to either promote or restrict. Uh, and would she expect NASA to delay its design and development work until NASA completes a study on the joint use of propulsion systems with the Air Force, commercial cargo carriers, and others before they could proceed with vehicle design? NASA studied the exploration uh, architecture for uh, years. Uh, I just worry that this amendment could be an unnecessary step. Would you care to comment, Ms. Cosmos? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall. Um, to the contrary, what this is intended to do is take advantage of the kinds of innovation that have already been developed and are being used uh, by both the Air Force and other government entities and to ensure that there's a robust competition in order to uh, uh, support and hasten and expedite the development uh, by using those uh, th 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 technologies that have already been developed and are being developed for uh, other federal agencies. Well, you, I haven't seen the amendment. I should have looked at it before asking a question. But do you have the word shall in there? Mm. Where's my staff? <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. What'd you say? It's what? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, it does. It says the administrator shall take appropriate actions to ensure the long-term affordability and sustainability of the heavy lift launch vehicle, including consideration of joint use of propulsion systems across civil, national security, and commercial vehicles. And, and would you expect NASA to delay its design and development work until NASA completes a, a study on the use of Propulsion system with that, the Air that, Force or that, cargo carriers? That certainly wasn't my intention. My intention was for them to assess what's already being done out there and to uh, ensure that there is competition in the procurement process that takes advantage of those things that are being developed or have already been developed by other federal agencies. That's okay. I thank you. I withdraw my problems with it. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. No. Um, let's have a, sh I guess we need a show of hands. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. Those opposed, raise your hand. Uh, the no's have it. Uh, the amendment is not agreed to. Um, the next amendment, well, first let me say this. I have noticed that Mrs. Jackson Lee has been in our audience uh, for much of the day. She is a former member of this committee, a value member of this committee, and a member of the Aviation and Space uh, Subcommittee. And we, uh, she's not able to directly participate because of the rules of the House that she's no longer on our committee, but has been a great resource as we've put the bill together. And we thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee, and hope to have your continued advice. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson. He is not here now. He just came to tell me that he is in his other committee uh, at, at a point where he is asking questions. Mr. Hall and I talked earlier uh, about not wanting to encourage people to have to wait to the end, but, but we all know we serve on more than one committee. And so if we come to a point where somebody uh, 
amendment is, is, uh, is, uh, is appropriate, but they're not here, then with joint agreement with Mr. Hall and I, they'll be able to um, bring that amendment forward at the end of the proceedings. So we will pass on uh, Mr. Grayson at this time. And um, unless some, uh, I should say, unless someone wants to introduce it for him or anybody, okay. If not, then the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady uh, or gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. Wilson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 034, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wilson of Ohio and Ms. Fudge of Ohio. I issue unanimous consent to dispense with reading without objection. So ordered, recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The authorization legislation before the committee today seeks to reaffirm our commitment to NASA, as well as ensure that America remains the world's leader in space and aeronautics. As a proud Blue Dog member of Congress, it is a priority of mine to ensure that NASA makes full use of its vast existing resources and the path forward outlined in this mark restructures our exploration program in a fiscally responsible manner. Many NASA facilities have recently been updated to reflect the testing demands of the missions outlined within the, this mark. Furthermore, this mark includes substantial funding to renovate existing facilities. It is the intent of my amendment to ensure that NASA utilize existing resources, either in their current or renovated form, and ensure that duplicative, yeah, it's hard to say, duplicative uh, testing facilities are not built. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge, would you like to, uh, or if, if there's, is there any further um, discussion? Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson is, is recognized again. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to withdraw my motion. Thank you, um, Mr. Wilson, and thank you for bringing that information to our attention. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> the clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 043, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment seeks to provide guidance and authority for the use of funds as proposed by the President to upgrade the Kennedy Space Center to create a 21st century launch complex capable of more efficient and more versatile operations for NASA, commercial, and military users. Many of the facilities at te and technologies at KSC and Cape Canaveral Air Force Station are literally vintage. For, in for instance, while we all have GPS on our Blackberries, the Eastern Range still operates using radar. There are many long overdue upgrades that are necessary to support NASA's next vehicle and to enable multiple users, such as the military, suborbital vehicles, and commercial launches. Expanding the capabilities on the Space Coast will leverage existing infrastructure and expertise and will allow for more effective and flexible operations. The modernization and utilization of KSC's workforce, facilities, and infrastructure by other users could lessen the negative impacts of the gap between the end of the shuttle program and the initiation of exploration activities. Additionally, the success of commercial space and eventual NASA vehicle will help to ensure that the maintenance of, uh, of our unique workforce continues. As you know, it's one of my highest priorities. But to enable this, we must bring KSC into the 21st century. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to support the amendment, and I yield back my time. Mr. Hall's right Mr. Now. Chairman, uh, I support the gentlelady's amendment. It, it just directs NASA administrator to carry out a program preparing the infrastructure at the Kennedy Space Center needed to support the exploration program authorized by this very bill. It also requires administrators to provide a report to Congress within 180 days with an implementation plan. And the amendment also directs NASA to do a study on an implementation plan to meet goals established under the 21st Century Space Launch uh, Complex Initiative. No direction is given to implement the plan. Rather, it calls for a report describing the initiative needed to meet the goals, a description of joint initiatives with the U.S. Air Force, and a timetable. I think this amendment is very worthwhile. I urge members to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I, I, I certainly agree. Um, 
this is an excellent amendment. Um, there is a unique workforce uh, in that area. Uh, they are under a lot of stress now. Uh, I think this is, a, is an excellent amendment to help really maintain that workforce uh, for uh, NASA and our country. Is there further discussion? If there's no further discussion on the amendment, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Oh, well, Mr. Peters was here, but I guess he... So we will treat Mr. Peters as, as we mentioned earlier um, and move now to, um, let's see, the, our 16th. So the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmas. Are you ready to proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 038, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmas of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. Thank Correct. you, Mr. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we all agree that the extension of the life of the International Space Station through 2020 is a very important initiative and uh, it serves to maximize the $100 billion investment already made in the International Space Station. However, it's extremely important that we determine what parts and what components we might need to deliver to the International Space Station, especially in the case of large heavy replacement systems and structures. This is to ensure that the promise to extend the International Space Station to 2020 is not just an empty gesture. It is important to remember that to this point, decisions about which instruments and equipment were delivered to the ISS were based on the assumption of the need to support the space station only through 2015, not through 2020. Right now, we have no answers as to how we will get the equipment necessary to extend the life of the International Space Station without the shuttle. This amendment would direct the administrator to review and report to Congress on the components needed to fully service and support the extension of the space station. Right now, 10 shuttle flights worth of flight-ready payloads averaging between 40 and 50,000 pounds per flight are sitting in storage warehouses, ready to fly and ready to use, over 1,400 parts and pieces of equipment. We don't know how many or which of those grounded payload items might actually be needed in order to ensure the station can be supported and maintained until 2020. Not only that, we do not know which or how many of these items are simply too large or too heavy to be carried to orbit by any existing vehicle other than the space shuttle. And finally, we do not know what additional items might need to be ordered, manufactured, and delivered in the future, or what launch vehicle capacity will be needed to deliver them to the station. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment and require NASA to quickly report back on what additional resources and equipment are needed to fully utilize the International Space Station through 2020 on how to deliver this equipment to the space station. I urge your support, and I yield back my time. Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I originally opposed this amendment because it contained an unfunded provision to keep shuttle contracts open for the entire fiscal year 2011. But since the gentlelady has removed that provision, I think it would be helpful for NASA to thoroughly review the needs of the space station and report back to us. I support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hall. I agree this is a common sense, constructive amendment that will help uh, make NASA more efficient. Uh, and I agree. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If there's no further discussion, the motion uh, uh, occurs, vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment uh, on the roster, number 17, is offered by the gentlelady from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Mr. Chairman, I'm withdrawing that amendment. Thank you, Ms. Edwards, and thank you for the input. Uh, and the information. Um, mm -hmm. The next amendment is number 18. It's offered by the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. Um, the clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 039, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Hey. Mr. Chairman, I, I hope the members on both sides of the aisle listen to this argument very carefully. The adoption of this amendment is essential 
if this bill is to work. Because if we do not give a preference to either U.S. government funded or U.S. private sector funded uh, launch capability, the agreements that NASA may have in mind with the Russians will simply allow the Russians to underbid our private sector launch capability and we will probably end up outsourcing more of our launch capability to the Russians. Uh, they don't have to establish a market price for their launch capability and we will continue going down a road that was started over 15 years ago during the reign of Administrator Dan Golden uh, where much of our aerospace uh, uh, capabilities uh, ended up not being funded because we have to fund the Russians to keep the International Space Station going. Now, I believe that we need a public and private partnership. And uh, during my chairmanship of the committee, uh, former Congressman and Chairman Bob Walker's uh, commercial space bill was passed and signed into law by President Clinton. We need to avoid duplication of costs. But we also have to recognize that the 800-pound gorilla out there that does not have to uh, charge for their services and the market-based price is Russia. And uh, as a result, without this amendment giving preference to launch capability made in the USA, either by the government or by American-based private sector companies, we simply will not be able to compete. And all this amendment does is it says that if there is a capability on the part of American public sector or private contractors, they shall be given preference. And this is the only way that the loan guarantees that are contained in this bill will end up working. It's the only way that we will be able to develop a viable and healthy private launch capability, not using government funds, but uh, uh, using the inventiveness of the private sector. Uh, I think you could call this amendment the prevention of outsourcing a launch capability uh, to Russia and perhaps in the future to China, and I would strongly urge its adoption. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Um, Sinchbrenner, for that constructive amendment. Is there further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Hall is recognized. This is almost a Buy America deal. I, I support the gentleman's amendment. It's sensible that we first promote and encourage our own United States companies, very capable companies, uh, and capabilities before relying on foreign partners. I urge its passage. I agree. It's a sensible Sinchbrenner amendment. If there's no further discussion, then all uh, in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is passed. And the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Cosmos. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 042, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Cosmos of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, you and the other committee members are aware of the fact that I have worked very hard uh, and I've articulated many times today that we are seeking solutions that minimize the human space flight gap. This is important not only to our workforce but to maintaining Americans' leadership in human space exploration and, as I often say, maintaining that ability to inspire the next generation uh, to engage in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and that, that inspiration has uh, served us well for the last 50 years and I think will continue to do so. Last year, I succeeded in eliminating the hard de deadline for the shuttle retirement in order to ensure that all scheduled missions were flown. I've also been pushing to officially manifest what is currently designated STA-335, the Launch on Need mission. Providing for the launch of this mission, which will have already been processed and ready to go in support of STS-134, will have several benefits which I believe are essential and a worthwhile investment. As I said, this mission will help to minimize the spaceflight gap by stretching out the human spaceflight capabilities into mid-2011. This will ease the transition for the unique and highly skilled professional workforce, not just at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, but across the country. 
Many have expressed concerns about the difficult time we would have in reestablishing this valuable and cr critical workforce should it be disbanded. Maintaining a large portion of the workforce and the infrastructure into 2011 will provide a better transition and will allow us to be preparing for the follow-on program, which NASA will be working to define during this period. This launch on need flight will also help to ensure that the International Space Station is both serviced and utilized to its best potential. The extended life of the International Space Station enables us to fulfill our need to explore by serving as a test bed for exploration technology development, and it will help us to address the needs here on Earth through physical and life sciences research. But we can only ensure its viability for a longer lifetime by using the shuttle our only domestic capability to deliver large spare parts and replacement hardware that were cut from the manifest when the decision was made to arbitrarily cancel the shuttle program in 2010. A list of the hardware which is fully built and stored at Kennedy Space Center is uh, not attached, but here in my hands for your uh, consideration. This additional launch provides the most risk-free logistical support in the next year. We should take this critical step to maximize the $100 billion investment given the recent decision to extend the life of the International Space Station to 2020. I urge you to support my amendment and to authorize this critical shuttle mission in order to preserve our workforce and maximize the investments we've made in the International Space Station, and I yield back. Ms. Cosmos, let me uh, thank you very much. Uh, you have stated very well the need uh, for this um, uh, uh, launch on need shuttle mission. It provides us a great deal of extra flexibility um, and, uh, again, uh, helps to uh, maintain the, uh, the good workforce that is in your area. Is there further discussion on this? If not, then all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Okay, Mr. Peters, um, we um, mentioned earlier that if someone is not there uh, when their amendment comes, that we will take in consideration that we all have a variety of different uh, committees to attend. Yours was just a couple before, and so we want to move back to your amendment. If there's no objection, and let's see, what amendment is that? Okay, uh, does the gentleman have, Mr. Mr. Peters, are you prepared to proceed? Hi, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 050, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Peters of Michigan. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, we uh, pursue human spaceflight beyond low Earth orbit, uh, the safety and the well-being of our astronauts uh, is, of course, uh, paramount to all of us. Um. However, I also remain concerned uh, about the research recently proposed by NASA that seeks to determine the effects of deep space radiation in humans using a research method that has not been employed uh, in decades, radiation testing on non-human primates. NASA already possesses the results of 40 years of radiation experiments performed on non-human primates by NASA, the Air Force, and other military agencies. And I have concerns that additional federal funding of this research is duplicative inhumane and will not yield significantly new results to advance the safety of our astronauts. Primates, and specifically the squirrel monkeys proposed for this research, differ significantly from humans in psychological and genetic traits, and the proposed studies on monkeys employ single doses of heavy ionizing, uh, ionizing uh, radiation, which may not effectively replicate the multiple doses and mix of radiation exposures that humans will encounter uh, when they're in deep space. Uh, certainly one of the best parts of NASA's uh, space exploration program is the way it has driven our technology forward, uh, bringing us great innovations like uh, microprocessors, uh, Velcro, and microwaves. Uh, we should also strive for equal technological advances in accompanying program, research programs instead of using technologies and methodologies that are over 40 years uh, old. Historical and ongoing studies included those funded by NASA and the Department of Energy already use validated non-animal methods to determine the effects of radiation on human tissues. These include vitro studies, computational science, space radiation modeling, exposure data, and decades of follow-up on space programs. 
The European Space Agency has already rejected the use of primates in research experiments, and NASA aerospace engineer April Evans resigned her position on the International Space Station program in protest of this testing, calling it a step backward for NASA animal testing uh, record. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, an amendment uh, before you. I've uh, had some discussions, Mr. Chairman, with uh, some other members of the committee that uh, had some concerns, and I do have a modification. Is it appropriate to talk about the modification at this time? Well, Mr. Peters, since we have that modification and everyone hasn't had a chance to see it, that, there, that needs to be uh, copied, distributed to everyone, and so with unanimous, without, without, um, with unanimous consent, I, I will ask you to uh, temporarily withdraw your amendment until it can be uh, uh, shown to everyone, and then uh, we will bring you back up at a later date. That's fine. Thank you. With no objection, uh, so ordered. And now we'll move on to the, the next amendment on the roster, which is a gentleman from Texas, Ms. Mr. Olson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 031, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Olson of Texas. I ask, did the clerk report the amendment? Okay. Yes, I ask unanimous consent to dispense the reading. Without objection, so ordered. The, I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, this amendment has already been discussed during the previous uh, amendment of my colleague from Florida, and so I'll be very brief. I strongly support the Exploration Space Operations Budget, and as such, wanted to offer alternative, me alternative methods of paying for the launch on need flight. I support the launch on need flight if it's necessary, safe, and paid for. For example, I'm frustrated that funds continue to be budgeted for post-shuttle workforce transition from within NASA's own budget. Their workforce transition funds in other departments, the Department of Commerce, for example, and unspent stimulus funds that should be made available to assist the workforce. Forcing NASA to use their scarce financial resources this way seems counterintuitive to me. But I withdraw my amendment realizing that this issue has already been voted on. And I just want to offer an alternative path to ensure we have a viable, fiscally responsible plan to execute a launch on need flight if necessary. I withdraw my amendment, yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Olson, and thank you for your continued constructive role you're playing in this important bill. Uh, the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from uh, Oregon, Mr. Wu. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. Clerk, report the amendment. Amendment number 051, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wu of Oregon. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment makes a very simple but very important improvement uh, to the bill, and it uh, directs NASA to take into account geographic diversity uh, when uh, competing out where to locate retired space shuttles. Uh, the space program is a truly national treasure that belongs to each and every American. I believe that the process for selecting locations for the retired shuttle fleet uh, should uh, reflect this national interest uh, in space and in our space shuttle. The shuttle has played a central role in our nation's aerospace history, and I know that uh, there are deserving institutions across the country that have expressed strong interest in having uh, one of these uh, unique uh, vehicles. I think that it is very, very important that NASA's selection process be an even, even playing field for all institutions hoping to host a retired shuttle. Uh, my amendment is aimed at uh, bringing the underlying bill closer to achieving that ideal. Mr. Chairman, I want to stress that um, although some parts of the country uh, do not uh, have a substantial uh, space, uh, direct space connection and do not uh, uh, have personnel there or facilities there, that the support for our space program comes from the taxpayers of this country, uh, across the country, uh, regardless of whether these facilities exist, and that uh, the, a fair competition uh, for these vehicles, uh, even without winning the award, 
but, even, but just a fair competition maintains that interest, maintains that support for American human spaceflight, and, and I think that that is absolutely crucial uh, in this day and age of uh, constrained resources, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, I support the gentleman's amendment. It directs NASA to consider, quote, geographic diversity, unquote, among other considerations as it seeks to find permanent homes for the retired arbiter fleet. Uh, this is a subject that's really discussed a lot, uh, has been within this committee and on the streets. Uh, I agree with his premise that the arbiters needed to be located among different regions of the country to give our citizens some key ease of access to visit these very marvelous machines. East Texas, West Texas, Northeast Texas, even the, <laughs> even the 4th District of Texas, even the Panhandle would make excellent homes for the Arbiter Fleet. I believe his amendment makes good sense, and I urge members to support it. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If no... All in favor of them say aye. Oh, oh aye. excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. No, Ms. Cosmas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I want to uh, speak only on behalf of the workforce in the Kennedy Space Center who have processed and launched every shuttle launch uh, that has taken place and that I like to say that they have the shuttle system in their DNA as they've been doing it for literally generations. And I think it w it's most appropriate that one of the orbiters stay in Central Florida. Um, you can call it Central Florida, North Central Florida, West Central Florida, Kennedy Space Center, whatever uh, suits Mr. Hall is fine by me. Thank you, Mr. Cosmas. As I understand it, um, uh, this amendment would have no impact, or not, not no impact, but it would not uh, rule out that, that, that uh, likelihood. Um, is there further discussion? If no, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Oh. Uh, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. And now we have the, um, let's see here, the 22nd Amendment. The uh, next, uh, and the next amendment is on the roster is offered by the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Wilson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My amendment is at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 033, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wilson of Ohio, Ms. Fudge of Ohio, and Mr. Wu of Oregon. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dayton, in my home state of Ohio, is known as the birthplace of aviation. I'm very proud of the contributions that some of our state heroes have made it to flight, including Wilbur and Orville Wright, John Glenn, Neil Armstrong. Given NASA Glenn's significant contributions to space flight, space flight, as well as the contributions of numerous Ohio companies, I think that Ohio strongly deserves consideration as a permanent location for one of the space shuttles once they are permanently retired. However, I'm concerned that language contained in this mark would effectively eliminate any chance Ohio has of competing for one of the space shuttles. The language included at the end of Section 223 appears to give preference to locations with an historical relationship in either the launch, flight, operations, or processing of the space shuttle orbiters. I believe that the inclusion of some of this language would negatively impact states such as Ohio, California, Washington, Illinois, Oregon, and New York and the supposedly competitive process to obtain a space shuttle. Either this is a competitive procedure as set in line 17 and 18 of this mark, or it's not. And I believe that inclusion of this language would unjustly penalize Ohio and many other states in efforts to bring a retired shuttle orbiter to their state. Therefore, my amendment would remove the priority consideration language for organizations with the launch flight operations or processing role and once again level the playing field for this competition. I, think the, I thank the Chair and yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Mr. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, go ahead and Rick. Oh, oh, okay, Mr. Mr. Olson, Chairman? Mr. Chairman, uh, I, I'm speaking opposition to, to the amendment. Uh, I admire and respect 
my colleague's position, uh, Congresswoman Fudge and Congressman Wilson, uh, but I believe that striking this language is unnecessary. I don't feel that it's unreasonable to consider the efforts of over 30 years of launching, processing, and managing the shuttle program to determine the final location of an orbiter once the flights are complete. It should come as no surprise to anyone that I believe the people of Houston in particular have earned the right to house one of these orbiters, and every member of the Texas congressional delegation agrees with me. And so do the students of the Clear Creek Independent School District, the school district that serves the Johnson Space Center. Every student from kindergarten to 12th grade was invited to draw a picture or write a letter to Administrator Bolden extolling the virtues of Houston as the home for an orbiter. Would, would the gentleman yield for just a moment? Yes, sir. I, I, I see that I have a bill across the hall. I'm going to have to leave. Let me uh, just say that um, reluctantly I, I have to oppose this amendment. Uh, I think that it undermines a, a, a good balance that we've had in this bill. Uh, and the current language is not mandatory uh, uh, to go any place. But I think that it is, is a good balance. And, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I respectfully disagree with you. I mean, even though I grew up in the area, again, I was struck how exploration is a part of their everyday lives. These people interact with their neighbors every day. And because they are their neighbors, they're coaches, and for many, they're moms and dads. They grew up with a program that began before each one of them were born. And I'm not going to go on further because I know we can go down the line and every member can talk about the merits of an entity or a school or a museum in their district. I asked my colleagues to remember what the first word that's been said on every, every significant space mission we've had, Houston. And so with great respect for my colleagues from Ohio, I oppose this amendment. The original language does not restrict, it rewards. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The back. recognizes Ms. Fudge. I would just like to respond to the statement of the first word said it. And you're right, it was Houston, but the guy who said it's from Ohio. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Wilson. Ms. Fudge, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, too, would support uh, this amendment because it does strike certain language in the competitive considerations for the disposition of, of the decommissioned orbiter vehicles. It amends the priority consideration given to locations with an historical relationship with the launch, with flight operations or pro processing of the orbiters, to allow for priority consideration for all locations with an historical relationship with the orbiters. And with all due respect to my friends from Florida and Texas, I think the rest of us would like a fair opportunity to compete. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Fudge. The Chair will recognize Ranking Member Hall. I thank you, and I'm willing for you to compete. I, I think under the bill, it, the language that's in the bill, you certainly would get to compete. And you quote Wilbur and Orville. <coughs> I knew both of them. <coughs> <laughs> and I really believe they'd want it in East Texas, but uh, but to help this committee and to help us all stay together and help us try to keep down so much uh, talk on each of these amendments and so much red tape, I report to you that Wilbur and Arville's first contract with the government was one page handwritten. The tilt rotor, the tilt wing that, you know, flies straight up and out, there's just the paperwork alone weighs 22,000 pounds on that. So maybe we are letting it get away from us. Uh, whether it's in East Texas, North Texas, wherever it is, I think we have a good program for it. Uh, this amendment uh, strikes a key language in the bill that's intended to give priority consideration for the disposition of the shuttle to eligible applicants who can demonstrate a historical relationship with either the launch, flight operations, or processing of the orbiters. It only makes sense that in deciding the fate of the arbiters, the NASA administrators should give special consideration to those eligible communities whose livelihoods depended on the program for decades. While the shuttles are a national treasure, they hold special value for the people who built, operated, and launched them into space. These are the men and women who work day and night to ensure that our astronauts were able to safely travel in space and assemble the incredible International Space Station. Uh, we honor them, their families, and their efforts through this uh, provision that's on the books. Uh, I join the, the chairman and urge the members to vote no on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Hall. The chair will recognize Mr. Wu. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I want to express how strongly I feel about this amendment. I have been a strong proponent 
of American human space flight, and that is with no connection for the constituents that I serve other than the vision of Americans going into space, its importance for our nation as a whole, and the, and the dream that it breeds in every child in America and for a lot of adults also. Those regions that have current facilities, that have a lot of employment, that have workers who have served America well, they have been well rewarded for those efforts. Taxpayers across this entire country have paid for these efforts. The economic benefits have been concentrated in a few places. Surely the opponents of this, this amendment would not begrudge the rest of America some participation in the dream. And that is what it's about. A lot of development occurred in Huntington Beach, California. But are you going to deny Southern California a fair shot at having an orbiter? I don't know how much taxes New York pays, but I suspect that it's substantial. And I think that denying folks in New York an opportunity to have an orbiter is unconscionable. Now, I admit that the chances of having an orbiter in Portland or Seattle or in Oregon are maybe a little bit slight, but I think my constituents would like to believe that they have a fair shot at this because they were denied an opportunity to work on the shuttle in the first place. This is a travesty. This is an absolute travesty. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Wu. The, ch the chair will, rest will recognize Mr. Rohrbacher. Well, let me identify myself with that last outburst. <laughs> uh, if the gentleman would yield. I certainly will. <laughs> I've learned from the best. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me just note that uh, uh, California did play a major role in the development of the orbiter and, and the space shuttle. I remember when I was a young reporter, uh, one of the first stories I covered was going to Downey where they had the very first mock-up of the shuttle. And there it was right there in the heart of Southern California. I walked into this big facility, and there it was. And John, what it was, Senator John Tunney was having a press conference to announce his support uh, of the shuttle program. And uh, as my colleague noted, uh, many of the components, not only was it Southern California, but to my hometown as well, Huntington Beach, very much involved with developing the technologies and parts of the shuttle, and uh, for us to be, uh, uh, you know, say, fenced off from having uh, this honor of, of, of hosting uh, what was left of this program, I mean, I, it is unconscionable. And I, I think that all states uh, should have a say in this. All, as, as my colleague stated, all the taxpayers uh, participated in financing this. And I know that the people in California, a lot of people in California had played a role in actually building it and developing the technology. So I would be very much in favor of this amendment because I think it is fair to everybody and certainly uh, uh, is, it's unseemly to have uh, certain states say, no, we're going we're gonna to have the, the leverage on saying where, who gets some of the credit or who gets to uh, show their children uh, the, this shuttle uh, uh, now, that, now that the program's over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rohrbacher. The chair will recognize Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. I, I do not agree with the outburst. I recognize the sincere emotion, but I want to say that the space exploration has been some of the most important and productive research for this nation. Every single living human being has gained from it. People moved from all over the country in various places where all of this work was going on. All of it didn't go in the same place. So I don't know why we're doing all this talking about where these unused pieces of metal will be. We all can read. We all know that we all had a hand in the development and I think it's an unnecessary waste of time to be fussing over this. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Is there any further, further discussion? Madam Chair, one, one final comment, please. Y yes. Thank you, Madam yeah, Chairman. Actually, I just no, want to. Actually, Why is it Mr. Smith? Yeah, Mr. Smith, would you consider yielding to Mr. Olson? 
No, we're going to. Yeah, Mr. Neugebrauer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will yield the balance of my time to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson. Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues from Texas, Madam Chair. One. I just want to point I really again I really appreciate my colleagues comments and opposition to it and I don't want to be something where we're not we're not uh, being fair to other states and I don't think that that's the case with the language that launch flight operations and processing should be considered I also ask you to consider um, the value of the shuttle being at a place like we have at Space Center Houston because you can see the entire history of human spaceflight right there. I mean, you can get it, you can take children, your grandchildren to the facility, you can see the Mercury Redstone, you can see the Gemini, uh, the Gemini rocket, you can see a Saturn V in a hangar, an unbelievable sight. And to have a space shuttle there complementing that, it gives, it gives the American public uh, just a complete appreciation for how far we've come in human spaceflight. You see that little tiny Mercury rocket and realize that we actually flew our first astronauts in space on that thing and what we evolved to with the shuttle. I mean, again, I, you can't underestimate that. And uh, there is going to be a competition. We're just asking for consideration for what uh, the Johnson Center, the Kennedy Center, the Marshall Center, all the centers, California as well, what they've done. But uh, I think it's important and you, you look at it in the big context. It really is something that matters to the American people. And we can give the, our youth a real understanding of how far we've come and they can feel the pride we felt on July 20th, 1969, when the man who testified here a couple of months ago, Neil Armstrong, put that foot on the moon and said, one small step for man, giant leap for mankind, and I know where he was from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Madam Chair, Chair I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Olson. The show recognizes Mr. Baird. I want to associate myself with remarks of Mr. Wu. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk in this institution about the need to do away with earmarks. The idea being that earmarks somehow prejudice spending in one direction or another and uh, unduly restrict competition in favor of powerful individuals, be they in the House or Senate. This uh, language as it currently exists that would be corrected by the gentleman uh, from Oregon's amendment, the, the, the underlying language sounds sure an awful lot like an earmark to me. And uh, I just would question how those who are opposed to earmarks can uh, uh, in good conscience support this. You know, there's a little place called Boeing up north that had a fair bit to do with the history of aviation. They've got a magnificent uh, air and space museum. Uh, it's proximal to a whole lot of Americans, and, uh, and there is a long history of flight there as well. And in contrast to the underlying language, the language Mr. Wu is offering is not an earmark. It's calling for fair competition. Uh, he's just saying we ought to have a real fair competition, not some, some very cleverly drafted language. He, Mr. Wu, to his credit, has not offered language saying it shall go to a particularly aviation museum located in a Pacific Northwest state. <laughs> he hasn't done that. He's just said, let's have a fair and objective competition. And I think that's right. And there are a host of, uh, of areas in this country. Uh, uh, and I agree with the uh, geographical diversity. I want, my, I want my kids to be able to go home somewhere and see a space shuttle nearby. And if, if the underlying language passes, uh, instead of this amendment, I think that's going to be improbable. And, and I respect the long and proud tradition of all my colleagues who, who uh, represents districts where these were constructed. But I will tell you, with respect to the gentle lady from Texas, I don't consider the space shuttle a, a hunk of metal. When I go to the Smithsonian Institution down the street here and I can look at the Mercury capsule and the Gemini capsule, it, it blows me away. It, take, it literally takes my breath away to think a human being got in that and went into space. And it, I was just there two weeks ago with my family who flew out uh, for the 4th of July celebration and I took all my nephews and nieces and we walked there and we looked at that and I told them the story. And I want to be able to do that at least uh, somewhat more proximal. And with that, I commend the gentleman from Oregon urge passage of his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? No further discussion? Um, the vote will occur on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 The no's appear to have it. Ask for a recorded vote. Okay. Um, the clerk will call a roll call vote. Chairman Gordon. No. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Aye. Mr. Costello votes aye. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes aye. Ms. Woolsey.
Ms. I just want to be clear, Ms. Johnson? No, okay. Ms. Woolsey? Mr. Wu? Aye. Mr. Wu votes aye. Mr. Baird? Aye. Mr. Baird votes aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Mr. Miller votes aye. Mr. Lipinski? Aye. Mr. Lipinski votes aye. Ms. Giffords? Ms. Giffords? Ms. Gifford votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Davis votes no. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Chandler votes no. Mr. Carnahan. Yes. Mr. Carnahan votes aye. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Hill votes aye. Mr. Mitchell. Aye. Mr. Mitchell votes aye. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Wilson votes aye. Ms. Dahlkepper. Aye. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes aye. Mr. Grayson. No. Mr. Grayson votes no. Ms. Cosmas. Ms. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Aye. Mr. Peters votes aye. Mr. Garamendi. Aye. Mr. Garamendi votes aye. Mr. Hall. No. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Lamar Smith votes no. Mr. Roy Barker. Mr. Roy Barker votes aye. Mr. Bartlett. No. Mr. Bartlett votes no. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Lucas. Mrs. Biggert. Mrs. Biggert votes aye. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Nagerbauer votes no. Mr. Inglis. Mr. McCall. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes no. Mr. Brown. Mr. Olson. <laughs> Mr. Olson votes no. Uh, Mr. Rothman is not recorded. Mr. Rothman votes aye. Is there anyone else that would like to be recorded? If not, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 18 members voting aye and 14 members voting no. The ayes have it. The amendment is uh, agreed to. The next amendment offered on the roster is offered by the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 079, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Mr. Chairman, this amendment represents a continuing effort on my part to get a simple answer to a simple question, which is where these commercial entities that seek to supplant NASA in doing launches of human beings into space, where they will be doing those launches from. Um, I asked this question of the NASA administrator a few months ago. He told me that he had been assured by every single commercial launcher that the commercial launches that they would want to do would take place from the Kennedy Space Center in Central Florida. That makes perfect sense to me. The government has invested tens of billions of dollars in developing manned space programs in Central Florida. There are thousands and thousands of people who have devoted their working lives 
to the manned space program in Central Florida. So I think that's the logical answer. But when I pressed to get specifics or even some sort of written confirmation of that, uh, the NASA administrator left me hanging. So this amendment is my effort to follow up on that. I see some hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, that um, this may not need to come to a vote because I'm still hoping that the NASA administrator will give me the specifics that I'm looking for. So I intend to take this up later on in the legislative process, but for now I withdraw this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grayson. And uh, you had given notice earlier that you had to, uh, I think you were asking questions in your other committee. So if there is no objection, since you're here, um, uh, okay, we'll go back to your earlier um, uh, amendment. Mr. Chairman, would you refresh my time? Is, is the gentleman, uh, does the gentleman have a amendment at the desk? Yes. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 080, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Grayson of Florida. I uh, unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I uh, recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're now facing what has been referred to as the dual track, the two tracks, two different ways to go forward with manned space flight um, under NASA's wing. One way is to continue what we've been doing for half a century, which is to have government operations launch men into space. The other is to try to develop that capability through commercial entities. I think that both are possible, both are conceivable. Only one of those is actually proven and demonstrated but I can imagine the possibility of it happening in the future that commercial entities will one day have that capability. What I don't understand is why we should load the dice in favor of those commercial entities. The government frequently comes across this distinction. It's in, in, in uh, the Defense Department. It's known as the make or buy decision. Do you make something or do you buy it? For 50 years now, we've been making manned space flight at NASA. And now the possibility apparently is arising that we might conceivably one day be able to buy it. That's a decision that's been made over the years in accordance with the Office of Management and Budget Circular A76, which basically says if it's better to make it, you make it. If it's better to buy it, you buy it. And that's the rule throughout the government, including the rule right now in NASA. As I read this bill, this bill would change that rule. It would put a thumb on the scale in favor of commercial entities, which frankly, don't seem to deserve it. Um, as I said before, they may or may not ever develop this capability. Why we should be biased in their favor is something I find hard to understand. But I see in four different locations in this bill, and that's exactly what's happening. For instance, if you turn to page 25, you'll see the language as follows. If one or more United States commercial entities are certified to provide ISS crew transportation and rescue services, the crew transportation system developed under this section shall be available as a backup ISS crew transportation rescue service as needed, but shall not be utilized as the primary means of ISS crew transportation and rescue, or otherwise compete with the commercial system for ISS crew transportation rescue services. So what this means in a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, is that as soon as any commercial entity is simply certified to provide ISS crew transportation and rescue services, then the program that has stood us so well for the past half century goes by the wayside permanently. I just don't get it. I don't understand why we'd want to do that. We've all heard the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It seems through this bill and these four provisions that I've identified, what we're really saying is if it ain't broke, throw it away. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm perfectly willing to see a level playing field, a fair competition between government programming and commercial entities doing the same programming. That's fine. I don't see any harm to that. But why we would say that the minute any particular commercial entity merely is certified in order to provide ISS crew transportation rescue services, and that in itself means the demise of the government program, that I don't understand at all. I've identified three other places in the bill that also tilt the playing field in favor of the commercial entities that are entirely unproven. And again, as I said earlier today, these are entities that have no sales, they have no profit, they have very little capital, 
They have no experience. And in fact, they have no product. They don't even have something that would launch human beings into space at this point. And we're saying that as soon as one of them is simply made qualified, then we throw out the entire manned space program as we know it and as we've developed it for the past half century. If you turn to page 47 of the bill, you'll see that Congress, by this bill, would be affirming the policy of making use of United States commercially provided ISS crew transportation and crew rescue services to the maximum extent practicable, which under this bill means limiting to the maximum extent practicable, the use of the system developed under Section 202, which is in fact the government alternative, to non-ISS missions once commercial crew transportation and crew rescue services that meet safety requirements become operational. I want to see a fair competition. We've been led astray many, many times by government contractors who overpromise and then don't deliver. There's not a single country in this entire world with a manned space program that does this the way that this bill dictates. All I want to see is a fair level playing field between whatever commercial alternatives develop and the program that has stood us so well for the past 50 years. Therefore, I respectfully ask people's support for this amendment to level the playing field. Thank you. Mr. Hall is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I oppose the gentleman's amendment. I think the existing bill uh, itself strikes a good playing ground, it strikes a very good balance between ensuring that we can meet our obligations to the nation, encouraging commercial development of our space in a measured and rational way. If commercial crew entities can deliver on their claims and do so to NASA's safety standards, there's no reason why they should not be included in NASA's mix of space transportation. This amendment takes that away. I oppose the amendment. Uh, Mr. Garamendi is, rec is recognized. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment uh, does allow for commercial human spaceflight, but what it does is to change the prioritizations. I think Mr. Grayson is absolutely right in what he's proposing. I also uh, asked staff a while ago a definition of a commercial company. Uh, apparently, in existing law, a commercial company can, in fact, be a foreign-owned company, that is, one that has more than 50 percent ownership. It can also be a company that has 50 per, uh, something less than 50 percent ownership by a foreign. The language in the current bill says United States commercial company. And I'm quite curious as to which definition applies and exactly what United States commercial company is. It seems to me that we may, in fact, be opening the door to commercial companies that are not majority owned in the United States and not controlled by United States interests. Uh, and therefore, not only is Mr. Grayson's amendment appropriate, but it may be even supercharged by a question of who controls the commercial company and I would recommend the passage of his proposal. Mr. Robacher is recognized. Well, let me just uh, suggest that I, I don't agree with the fundamental uh, logic of what uh, Mr. Grayson, who I respect his, um, his intelligence, and I re respect that he has a point of view, but I don't think that his argumentation actually is consistent. The fact is we are not loading the dice uh, if anything, the dice have been loaded in favor of having a government-run space transportation system. That's the way the dice have been loaded. All of the money goes through the government and through NASA uh, uh, and goes into this type of, uh, of, of government approach. And that's one of the big debates we're having. This is a, you know, Luke Skywalker versus uh, Han Solo debate here. And, uh, let us, I mean, there's two fundamentally different approaches to people in space. Do we want entrepreneurs in space? Do we want businessmen in space? Do we want government employees to be the only ones who get to go into space and have these activities? We're just laying the foundation so that the commercial sector can play a role. Uh, the, we did the same thing with the railroads. But, and let's just note, in the beginning of our country's history, there was some uh, uh, people who wanted us to build all of the American ships. The ships would be built by the government. 
But instead, our fa our, the people who founded our country had a very good understanding that, no, we're going to leave this transportation across that great ocean to the private sector. We thus developed in the private sector the clipper ships, which became the dominant force for commerce in the whole world. And America was that playing that role, and we were the ones who did this without government uh, uh, having to approve of everything and uh, – and co-opt all of the funds that were necessary. And when we wanted to develop a railroad, yes, the government played a role. The government provided a certain amount of wealth, meaning land on either side of the track, to promote the commercial activity. I think we would have a far different country today had we decided uh, early on in our country's history simply to have the government running all the transportation systems and all the people in the transportation systems working as government employees. It would be a different world. It would be a different country. I think we're better off by the direction that we took. What's going on here is an attempt to ease us away from, the, from what had been co-opted by a total government approach to now going into a more private sector approach. And there are companies in the private sector uh, – who I disagree with Mr. Grayson, who have great track records in building space transportation technology. Boeing and Lockheed, you look at the Delta system and the Atlas system, these are very good systems, yes, and they were done in cooperation with government, but now let's see if we can attract, by definition, more money from the private sector into, the, into this whole uh, arena of space transportation uh, if we do not do that, it will be the government's job, and it will be only taxpayer money. And what's, what's the problem with allowing the commercial people to come in and spend some of the money that we would otherwise be spending in the, uh, from the taxpayers? So I would oppose this amendment, and I would hope that uh, we all agree that it, it, it would be a good thing to have commercial investment in space and to encourage that, and that would be a boon to the taxpayers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Obaka, for number three. And Ms. Giffords is recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I have to just speak in opposition respectfully of the amendment. When looking at the language, the bill actually does not require that the government system be shut down if a single commercial provider is qualified for launch. Rather, the provisions just allow that the commercial provider can fly to U.S. astronauts to the ISS, they actually don't prohibit NASA from developing or flying its government program. And in fact, if, if this bill had, I wouldn't support the language myself. What we're saying is that we don't want the government unfairly competing with the private sector once they satisfy all of NASA's requirements. And that said, as in the case with many other, other government make or buy decisions, the bill itself makes clear that the commercial systems can't cost more than the government provided on a seat or on a dollar per seat basis. And of course, as Mr. Grayson knows, OMB Circular A76 is actually not law. It's an executive branch directive. So be that as it may, um, we will not be giving an unearned and undeserved preference to commercial entities, as, as was asserted in the de dealer colleague um, that he circulated. They're going to have to meet all the requirements laid out in the bill before they can be considered for contracts with the federal government. And again, as we've been saying, it's that balance between government, private sector, and I, th I think this strikes a fair balance. Thank you, Ms. Giffords. So if there's no other discussion, then all in favor of the, of the motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 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 The no's have it. The amendment is not agreed to. I think we have time for two more amendments. And so um, uh, the next amendment on the roster is offered by the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Fudge. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 070, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Fudge of Ohio and Mr. Wilson of Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment directs the administrator to conduct a study with the National Academies on the feasibility of a commercial space market, as we have yet to see a federal study on this industry. We need to determine the market demands for commercial human spaceflight, both home and abroad. Additionally, though this is only a five-year authorization, it is crucial that we have the financial data to determine whether a commercial spaceflight sector can sustain itself for the long term. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm glad to, to see that you value that you see value in conducting a study like this one described in my amendment. I look forward to working with you on the language and incorporating a commercial market study requirement before the committee brings this bill to the floor. And I withdraw my amendment at this time. Thank you, Ms. Fudge. Uh, let me just remind members, uh, we have one more member to go before we're going to go to vote, or maybe we might even have more. Um, if we get this bill out today, as we are going to, then I, there is a reasonable chance that maybe next week, uh, if there is a lull, that we could get this on the floor, uh, which uh, I think would be very beneficial for us in trying then to go to conference. So we're going to move forward, and the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Matheson. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Oh, excuse me, the clerk report the amendment. Amendment number 065, <clears throat> amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Matheson of Utah. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you. I'll take less than five minutes, Mr. Chairman. This amendment clarifies NASA's obligation to fulfill requirements that are in the bill. It's What my language do is simple. It requires NASA to use the money that is authorized in this bill to perform work on the program spelled out in the bill. Uh, the underlying bill requires NASA to come up with a spaceflight plan within 180 days of enactment of the law. In the meantime, there's nothing to prevent NASA from continuing to fund the programs that are authorized. My amendment requires NASA to continue to fund programs and not use that money at a later date for terminating these same programs. Now, this is an amendment that's a result of bipartisan discussions on both sides within this committee. Um, I appreciate the help of both the Majority and Maury staff to uh, develop this amendment. And I, it's more of a perfecting amendment than anything else in terms of the underlying bill. And I urge my colleagues on both sides to support it. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matheson. Is there further discussion on this amendment? Uh, if not, the vote is on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed no. Uh, uh, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Mr. Robacher is up next. And since Mr. Robacher is up next, we know this might take a while. Um, so... Um, we will uh, take it. Uh, we will adjourn at this time to come back. Uh, this time, uh, five minutes uh, after the last vote. Thank you. The committee is called to order again, and I will uh, put folks on notice. It seems we're going to have a vote uh, in about an hour, and so I think we have an opportunity to complete this in an hour. Um, it may be a contradiction term to say that at the same time to call on Mr. Robacher, uh, but the next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by Mr. Robacher from, tech, uh, from California. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 045, amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Roy Bacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain uh, his amendment. Uh, this amendment requires NASA to provide uh, reports to Congress on the current in the current areas. Uh, that is the current laws prohibiting cooperation with the People's Republic of China. We need a report on exactly what those laws are, what the restrictions are. Uh, we need a report uh, from NASA on the level of transparency required by a nation in order to join the ISS coalition. Uh, we need to see that uh, in black and white, what would be required of any nation, and this, is, of course, is aimed at China. Uh, uh, if they don't have a certain level of transparency, we, we need to know whether or not that will mean they can still become a member of, uh, of the team and, and participate in the International Space Station. Uh, number three. Uh, we need a report from NASA on the military uses of the Chinese space program. The China supposedly has a uh, civilian space program, but uh, like all things, uh, look very closely in China, you'll find so much of it tied to the People's Liberation Army. And uh, we'd like to see uh, what uh, military uses are being put uh, to play by the Chinese in their space program. And uh, last, we need a report on the danger that is posed to the International Space Station by a, uh, a mission that the Chinese flew. Uh, and, and what they did is they launched a very um, a micro satellite uh, uh, near the International Space Station. It was on the path of the International Space Station. And we've never had an explanation 
of why this uh, little satellite was launched, and uh, uh, we need to get a full report on that particular incident. And uh, uh, so far, there has been no investigation, and uh, I think that we need explanations of, of what that was all about, and did that, and has that put the space station in jeopardy? And as the space station goes around uh, in its orbit, uh, this uh, Chinese uh, a uh, little miniature satellite could well uh, be a threat to the safety of the station. Uh, we need to know whether that's the case or not. And I think it's uh, fairly non-controversial. It's just uh, asking for reports on those areas, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the gentleman would yield, um, and I'm not trying to be catty or anything here, um, you, you later you have an amendment that says there can be no contact with with China. So, I mean, how do we how do we sort of you know, how do we make those two fit together? You mean how we can investigate without actually having a, a uh, uh, relationship with them? Uh, it says you can't even talk to them. Well, we're basically uh, not talking to them. We're uh, asking them questions. <laughs> yeah, Ben, if the other one is passed, by the way, if the other uh, amendment is passed, I will gladly withdraw uh, this amendment. Uh, well, if, if, again, if the gentleman – well, I'll just – I'll claim my own time. I, I think this investigation is something that would better be left to CIA or some other agency. I, I'm not sure that, that NASA has this ability. Um, and so for that reason – and again, and, and I am – maybe you can cure it later by saying you can talk to them, but this just doesn't seem to, um, uh, to be the right business for NASA. So is there further discussion? If there's no further discussion, Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hall is recognized. If Rohrbacher could talk to them enough, they might have a different opinion of us over <laughs> here. <laughs> I support his amendment. Uh, it simply asks for a report. Why not? Well, why not would be because it would take uh, resources. Oh, resources from NASA that that could be used for a number. Uh, 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 you know a number of other areas, as well as uh, it just doesn't seem like NASA. This is like, you know, asking um, the National uh, Department or, or the Department of Defense to look into something with, um, you know, hogs in, 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 in Texas. I just don't think it's the right, uh, right location. Is there further discussion on this amendment? Chairman? Uh, Mr. McCall is recognized. Thank you. I, I yield to the gentleman from California. Okay. Uh, well, let me just note that there is a lot of uh, – uh, I say a lot, a lot of movement going on now about furthering our cooperation with China. Uh, a lot of it is space cooperation. People are talking about bringing them into a space relationship, perhaps like we are with uh, with Russia. And uh, uh, let me just note for everyone here: there has been no reform in China as we've seen in Russia. You know, the churches are filled in Russia. There's opposition uh, parties and newspapers now. Obviously, they have not reached the the level that we'd like. But in China, they've actually retrogressed, and they are an incredibly repressive society. And I don't like to see the idea that we can uh, just nonchalantly sort of ease into a, 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 a uh, high-tech, uh, 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 space-related partnership with the Chinese. And uh, this report by NASA, who knows this, uh, 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 you know, the people on, on, in NASA, you know, know what issues are involved here in, and how they would want to cooperate. Uh, it seems to me that that uh, makes all the sense in the world for us to have an understanding on these particular issues about the level of transparency that we would require of the uh, member of any member of the uh, coalition running the International Space Station. Uh, why is that not a report that we could uh, expect? And what is it about the laws that uh, they are currently in place that prohibit certain cooperation with, with uh, Communist China? Uh, NASA would know that. Their legal counsel would know that. And what are the military uses of the Chinese space program? There is no reason why NASA cannot uh, ask our Defense Department uh, and the CIA and others uh, to help them prepare that report. And, of course, the danger to the space station by that Chinese probe uh, that is something that uh, NASA would actually be the lead uh, agency in. 
So I think this is an important issue because we're easing into what, would, what I consider to be a very unhealthy relationship with the world's worst human rights abuser. Thank you, uh, Mr. Robacher and, and Mr. Uh, McCall. Uh, is, uh, if there's no further um, discussion, then all in favor of the amendment say aye. Opposed, no, no, no. One, two. It looks like the, the no's have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. Thank you very are much. You, is, uh, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 125, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry I got so shook up over Mr. Wu trying to take stuff out of Texas. Uh, I, I do have an amendment at the desk, and I want to thank you and the ranking member for considering it. This amendment is pretty straightforward. Uh, sensible amendment which clarifies section 405 of the bill. We need to ensure that NASA has a clear plan in place to put NASA-owned aeronautical structure, infrastructure back on track to fill the U.S. and long-term aeronautics research needs. In order to ensure that NASA develops a plan to stabilize and reverse the deterioration of NASA's aeronautics, ground test facilities, my amendment specifies that this report be completed within one year after the enactment of this act. NASA's aeronautics test program ensures the capability, availability, and accessibility of testing facilities to meet the U.S. aeronautics needs for NASA, other government agencies, and commercial customers. These facilities provide vital testing and demonstrate new technologies, materials, structures, and flight concepts, bringing understanding to the aeronautical behavior. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, I appreciate your considering this amendment, and I encourage my colleagues to support it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for that excellent uh, amendment. Is there further discussion? If there's no further discussion, then the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. All in favor, no. Or opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Let's see. I think Mrs. Uh, Fudge might be in. She, okay. Well, she has been pretty um, attending all today, so we will we'll see if, if she's going to be coming back. Um, and Mr. Wilson. Okay. So the next amendment on the roster is an amendment. Offered by the gentleman. Okay. Well, he may not have, we may just go back and pick it up afterwards. Uh, offered by the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Wilson, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 036, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Wilson of Ohio. Mr. Chairman, one of the things that I'm most pleased about okay. with this mark is, is the inclusion if, of Excuse me, if the gentleman will... Uh, Suspend. Which amendment did you? 036. 036? Okay, Mr. Wilson's. Okay, excuse me. We okay? I, I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. One of the things that I'm most pleased about this, Mark, is the inclusion of adequate funding for evidence-based programs to improve STEM education in our country. If America is to remain the world's leader in the space and aeronautics industry, we need a brilliant workforce of scientists and engineers at NASA. I represent a rural part of Ohio. Not many people know that former astronaut and Senator John Glenn grew up in a rural part of Appalachia, just west of my district in Ohio. I know that many of my constituents have been inspired by Senator Glenn's many accomplishments as well as while watching various NASA rocket or shuttle launches on TV. Sadly, too many of our rural students are struggling to receive the adequate STEM education they need to become a NASA astronaut or engineer. And too many of our teachers lack the resources needed to provide the STEM education necessary for students to look 
to enter NASA, the NASA workforce. My amendment asks that NASA also consider students in rural schools as they look to increase awareness in NASA and improve STEM education at all levels of schooling. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Um, Wilson. Uh, as a son of two farmers uh, and someone who represents a large rural area also, uh, I think this is an excellent uh, uh, amendment. And uh, I think that maybe the, the, the gentleman from the smallest county in Texas might have something to say about that also. I agree with the chairman. Yield back. All in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The, uh, the amendment is agreed to. Uh, if, if there's no objection, Ms. Fudge was the amendment before, and so uh, uh, we will bring her up again at this time. And so um, will the clerk report the amendment? Amendment number 071, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Fudge of Ohio and Mr. Wilson of Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment is very simple. It will ensure that we perform not only research and development for the technologies of the current mission, but also the research, development, and demonstration of the technologies needed for future missions. It will be quite a while before we put a human on Mars, but if we don't start now, the technology, R, D, and D, that will get us there, it may never happen. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fudge. Mr. Hall. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm inclined to support the gentlelady's amendment. It establishes an enabling technologies development and demonstration program under the space technology program. And it's unclear to me what the program contributes to the overall space technology program, but I'm told it'll add technologies that are needed to support the exploration program. Would the gentlelady help me understand just a little what she expects this program will accomplish and how it helps our overall exploration effort? For the record. For the record, Mr. Uh, ranking Member, it is exactly what you said. <laughs> That's what? Exactly what you exactly. said. That's exactly right. In that case, I'll yield back my time. <laughs> if there's no further discussion, um, since Ms. Fudge has educated Mr. Hall, then we will ask for a vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Next amendment. Uh, is um, offered by the gentleman from New Mexico. Mr. Lujan, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 064, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Lujan of New Mexico. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now more than ever, we must invest in educating the next generation of scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and innovators. The continuing underrepresentation of Latinos and other minority students in mathematics, engineering, and science fields will only contribute to the shortage of professionals available to work in these important industries. My amendment amends the STEM education and training section of the bill to ensure that participants in NASA STEM education programs include minority and underrepresented groups, including students from high needs local school districts. We must make sure that NASA is participating in active outreach to these communities of students who for too long have suffered from a STEM achievement gap. My amendment also allows for a special consideration to be given to minority serving institutions when NASA is establishing or expanding degree programs in, earth, in space and earth sciences, aeronautics, engineering, and other STEM disciplines. My amendment will support the creation of leaders and innovators within our minority and underrepresented communities who will be prepared to carry out NASA's mission for many years to come. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment and I thank you very much for your consideration. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Uh, 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 Governor Garamandi. Uh, just a quick question. The, um, I think the present language is both for um, all, kind, all levels of education. If, Mr. Chairman, if the gentleman would yield. Uh, well, let me just finish my question. If that is the case, then typically minority serving institutions are the higher level of education or the highest level. And if that's a modification to only go to highest level, then I think we may not want to do that. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Gentleman Gill? Sure, yield. Um, well, if you look, Mr. Uh, Garamundi, at uh, page 77 of the bill, there's 
Within the section here, we're targeting minority serving institutions for higher education, but the subsequent amendment and the language that goes on to follow is outreach to students from underrepresented groups as well to make sure that we're going out and we're recruiting over and beyond. The enabling legislation around the education section is reaching out to education of all levels, and I think it was purposely written that way, taking into consideration that NASA does have programs K through 12 and post-secondary education, and this would only emphasize that we need to make sure that, again, as we're looking at some of the, the programs that do exist, that we're paying attention to all parts of the country. Um, there's background coming from the National Science Board, Science and Engineering Indicators, from uh, NSF and from others that have compiled reports showing where degree programs, STEM bachelor's degrees earned by minority students is 17%, much lower than representation from other minorities in the country. So I'm not debating that urgent. point. I just want to uh, thank you for yielding back. I'm not debating that point. I agree entirely with it. I just want to make sure that we're not, in this language, inadvertently directing the money only to higher education. But apparently that's not the case. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hall is recognized. I have concerns about the amendment, uh, and my disagreement or concerns don't stem from the intent to reach out to minority students. Rather, this amendment makes several wholesale revisions to statutory references contained in the bill. But my main question is, when we first looked at, at the uh, bill, it had a general definition of institution of higher education, and it goes one through five in, lo in that additional uh, 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 purposes. That's stricken from the bill. I, I was just wondering why. If the gentleman would yield? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Hall, that was actually a recommendation from uh, Legislative Council. Um, that's something that could be added back. I asked that very question when we were giving the suggestion looking at this provision, and I'd be happy and I'd be very supportive to ask unanimous consent that the language uh, that was stricken which reads in parentheses as defined under Section 101A of the Higher Education Act of 1965, parenthetical 20 U.S.C. 1001, parenthetical A, and then closed triple time parenthetical uh, be added back, Mr. Chairman. Well, first, let me say that, um, that we've, in a number of hearings during the competes uh, reauthorization, it became very clear that uh, minorities, uh, women uh, were, uh, underserved were our best areas to bump up uh, in, those, uh, in those areas. And so that's what we're attempting to do. If there is some, um, so I support the gentleman's amendment. If there is some improvements that could be made uh, between now and the floor or in conference, then we need to continue to, to work on that. So if there's no further discussion, all in favor say Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Hall. I'd like to make another inquiry. If he's willing to put that uh, A through uh, 1001A, the general definition of institutions of higher education, back in those five definitions there, it would be a lot easier for us to support it. Or if he would consider that from here until the time it goes either in report language or otherwise. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to work with the ranking member and yourself to make sure that we're able to get language that was suggested by Legislative Council and see what's most appropriate to get back in. I know there's a lot, great deal of, of effort that's been put into this, and uh, if, there, if there's more effort that needs to be put into it, then, then we need to do that. Uh, if there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Texas. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The clerk will report the amendment. Yes. Amendment number 126, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Eddie Bernice Johnson of Texas. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the lady for five minutes to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking member, for considering this amendment. As you are aware, Section 601 of this bill focuses on improving STEM education and training at NASA. This section also instructs NASA, the NASA Administrator to consult with the Secretary of Education and the Director of the National Science Foundation to improve STEM education and training. My amendment ensures the gross underrepresentation of minority teachers in the United States classrooms as part of this discussion. The best way to improve elementary, secondary, and undergraduate and graduate level STEM education in our country is by addressing the absence of minority teachers who are well qualified. 
the achievement gap for minorities is staggering, but I am convinced it can be mitigated through the interaction of minority role models and minority youth, with minority youth. If children see someone who looks like them succeeding and encouraging them to achieve, then the prospects for those children to believe in themselves and fulfill their own potential are far greater. Uh, put simply, believing uh, is seeing. The best way we can strengthen our nation's scientific enterprise is to strengthen diversity so all Americans can compete in the 21st century. According to the Secretary of Education, 200,000 new teachers are hired each year nationally, and less than 2% or 4,500 are black males. This is unacceptable. To quote Secretary Duncan, our graduation, rate, graduation rates have gone up dramatically, and our dropout rates have, have, gone to, have to go down. But to get there, I'm convinced we have to have more people of color teaching, being role models and mentors. In my state of Texas, well over half of the student population is minority. But nearly 77% of the Texas teaching force is non-minority. The same diversity found among students is not found among teachers. The shortage of minority teachers is a serious problem. Uh, this is a serious problem, because not, but my amendment to the section of this bill, which tasked the NASA administrator to consult with other agencies, a good place to start. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, I appreciate your considering this amendment to ensure this discussion does not end here today, and I encourage my colleagues to support this amendment and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Once again, I think uh, all you said was very well documented in our hearings uh, on the American Competes Act. Uh, is there further discussion? If no, all, of, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And let me see. Mrs. Edwards is next, and she put us on notice earlier that she – oh, are you, are you going to do it? Okay. Uh, she will be back. She had a press conference. Uh, she's been very attentive today. Uh, so I understand that Ms. Fudge will offer that for her. So the next amendment on the roster is an amendment by the gentlelady from uh, Maryland who is, will be offered by the gentlelady from Ohio. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 064, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Edwards of Maryland. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading without objection. So ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Edwards' amendment adds a new section to Title VI of the bill, establishing a pilot program for hands-on space science and engineering education and training related to aeronautics, exploration, science, space operations, and human spaceflight that serve to stimulate and engage students in science engineering, and that foster skills including engineering, teamwork, project management, and problem solving. The emphasis of the pilot program will be on technology-related education and training. The whole point of this language and this pilot program is to get our young scientists engaged and active. The pilot program will have an emphasis on underserved and underrepresented minority populations because we are losing our minority, our, our minority populations when it comes to math and science, and we have to aggressively make sure that we capture them and make sure they are included. I understand that there is an issue with the appropriations language in this amendment. I am fine with changing this language to such sums from within the funding authorized for NASA's education program. I encourage everyone to support this important amendment that will benefit our young folks by engaging them in science and technology and making our future stronger. Mr. Chairman, I urge support and yield back. Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Fudge. You did an excellent job as a stand-in for, for Mrs. Edwards. And once again, this is, this is a, a very good amendment, as we would expect from her. Is there further discussion? If not, all the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered um, in person by the gentlelady from Ohio, Ms. Fudge. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Oh, excuse me. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 072, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Fudge of Ohio and Mr. Wilson of Ohio. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. 
Without objection, so ordered. And the gentlelady has five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, th this amendment adds a provision to the institutional management section that will ensure that our unique and state-of-the-art facilities receive proper consideration for modifications. In addition to maintenance, repair, upgrading, and modernization, the administrator will include an assessment of what structural modifications must be made to maximize the usage of our strongest assets and significant financial investments. I urge, uh, I urge passage. Thank you very much. I, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Fudge, for improving this bill. Is there further discussion? If no, the amendment occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Robacher. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 048, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Roy Bacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Okay. This amendment reaffirms the policy uh, that already exists, basically, with respect to near-Earth objects as a threat uh, to our nation and, yes, to all of humanity. Uh, it restates the direct... Uh, the the direction that we've given the administration uh, to recommend a federal agency or agencies to be responsible uh, for um, designating those agencies by October 15th and those agencies that be designated yeah, yeah, yeah. with the responsibility of, of how to cope with a uh, well, near-earth object that is uh, uh, that might be observed and, and uh, then would be charted and would uh, perhaps be colliding with the earth and uh, then also the administration needs to designate uh, uh, what would be done and who would be uh, uh, responsible for the campaign and the efforts to deflect any major near-Earth object that was seen and, and observed heading towards the Earth. This is not a uh, – this is actually reaffirming policy that already exists, and uh, um, I think that it was very responsible, and we're just asking – in making sure the administration that we reaffirm that October 15th deadline. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. You have been a champion uh, in this area. Uh, oh, Mr. Um, uh, Barley is recognized. There's an old adage that says what's everybody's business is nobody's business, and somebody has to have responsibility for this. It was a near-Earth object that became a really near-Earth object that spelled the end of the dinosaurs. Then you could do nothing about it. Today we might be able to do something about it. It is very obvious with the capabilities we have today that we, somebody ought to be watching out there to see what's out there and to avoid a catastrophe if it's possible. So I support the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. If there's no further discussion on the amendment, all in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the amendment is agreed to. And um, the next amendment on the roster is also from the gentleman from California, Mr. Robacher. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Uh, yes, I am. I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 049, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Roy Bacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Okay. Uh, this amendment, uh, of course, is tied to the amendment that we just passed. And it reaffirms the policy in respect to the role of the Arecibo telescope uh, and the part that it plays uh, in the identification of uh, threats of near-Earth objects. Let's just note that um, with a, without the Arecibo telescope, uh, we will not be able to track uh, uh, a distant object that is headed toward the Earth and chart its course in time for us to have uh, a response. So the Arecibo telescope is uh, uh, essential if we are serious about the idea that uh, if a near-Earth object is, uh, is observed and uh, uh, we would then be able to chart its course to see if it actually was a threat. So again, this is reaffirming policy that exists. Thank you, Mr. Robacher. Uh, another good amendment. Is there further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. And the next amendment on the roster is offered by the gentleman from California, Mr. Robacher. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? 
Yes, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 044, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Roy Bacher of California. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Okay. Uh, this is an issue that I am uh, very serious about, and it's one we all need to consider very seriously because it goes to uh, the heart of the world that we're going to create I think I will. Uh, in the future. I happen to believe there are major threats to our national security and to the future of the world. One is on, our, one is on us right now. It's radical Islam, uh, but the other is uh, very close by, and that is uh, within a few years, we will see the emergence of an incredibly powerful China that has had no, and I say zero, political reform. Uh, we were told uh, over the years that if we just engage China and are more active with them in various uh, uh, ways economically and exchange programs and uh, things like space programs and such, that they would uh, evolve into a more democratic country because of the contact that they had with the West. Uh, this has been proven to be a horrendous mistake. Uh, this theory of getting close to a, uh, an evil force and that's going to make it, uh, some of your goodness is going to rub off, has not worked out. I call that the hug a Nazi, make a liberal theory. And it has not worked. Uh, the bottom line is what we've got now is we've had these exchanges with China, and it has led to nothing but a stronger, more aggressive, more threatening, and yes, at home, more totalitarian uh, government uh, that threatens the rest of us as well as its own people. Let us note that uh, of believers in God who are being thrown into jail today, uh, most of them, the majority of them, are, are in China. China is the world's worst human rights abuser, throwing Falun Gong members people who, ref who refuse to, uh, uh, to file and, and to uh, uh, register with the government as a, as a church under their direction are persecuted in that country still. No opposition parties, no freedom of speech, no unions, etc. Well, the last time we decided to cooperate with China in terms of uh, uh, lifting, uh, letting them lift, for example, our satellites on Chinese rockets, uh, there was an incredible transfer of technology that has done nothing but weaken us and strengthen this horrible dictatorship. So this amendment prohibits any exchange or contact between NASA uh, programs or personnel, including contractors, with uh, the People's Republic of China or any entity that is headquartered in the People's Republic of China. As I say, China continues to be aggressive in their stance on space issues. And they've already laid down their marker. They have, the, as I mentioned earlier, they launched a, uh, uh, some sort of a probe near the International Space Station, which actually uh, threatens the safety of that station. And we've never had any explanation of it. But we shouldn't be cooperating with a country that has such belligerent uh, uh, you know, uh, and provocative actions as that. Uh, and they recently shot down another satellite spreading debris uh, over an already dangerous environment. One of the things I'd like to see is cooperation on an international scale on debris. But are we going to let the worst uh, offender of all become part of that partnership? I don't think so. So there are no existing treaties or trade agreements between the United States and China that would be affected by this amendment. Uh, NASA has one agreement with the Chinese Academy of Sciences involving uh, geodynamics, uh, uh, some sort of uh, research that's going on there. Uh, NASA and China have had several unofficial information exchanges, uh, particularly on lunar, lunar data. But I would this amendment would basically prohibit us and prohibiting NASA from expanding uh, a relationship with this vicious dictatorship. I think that uh, uh, it will do nothing but, uh, and every time we've had this, as I say, it's resulted in a transfer of knowledge, not from them to us, but from us to them in a way that strengthened uh, the, the government of, of, uh, that, that is repulsive to the values that we hold dear as Americans. So I would ask, uh, I know this is uh, rather uh, controversial or whatever, but I would ask my colleagues to join me 
in making this declaration that we are not going to enter into a partnership with uh, the Communist Chinese, at least until we see some uh, reform on their end, and then we can rescind this uh, uh, restriction on NASA. I yield back my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Robacher, um, Mr. Mr. Uh, for your consistency. Um, I, I think the amendment goes more than, than says that we can't enter into an agreement. It says that we can't even discuss uh, agreements with him. I, I remember, uh, or anything else, I remember former Secretary of State Jim Baker on one occasion was asked about not having any kind of discussion with a particular country, and his response was, we should not be afraid to talk with anyone. Uh, if we're concerned about their debris, we've got to talk to them about, you know, about that. So I, I think that, that y you have some legitimate concerns, but I'm afraid that this amendment goes too far. Is there Mr. Further? Chairman? L L L uh, Dr. Bartlett. Mr. I that. would like to inquire of staff, if we pass this amendment, would it trigger sequential referral to international relations? Uh, uh, Council um, would answer the question, please. I don't believe so, no. Thank you. So that's a definitive maybe? <laughs> okay. Or maybe not, I guess. It was more like that. Is there further discussion? Dr. Barlett, did you have anything else you or uh, I was just concerned that uh, talking to other countries is really the um, uh, that whether you do or don't generally resides in International Relations Committee, not in other committees. And I was just concerned that if we pass this, would it trigger a sequential referral? Would the gentleman, would the, would the gentleman yield? Be happy to yield. Uh, let's, the gentleman's making a very good point, because when this is only restricting NASA from talking about specific programs of cooperation. We're not uh, talking about approaching them. Uh, the State Department has every right to approach them and to talk to them uh, as to whether or not they're willing to move forward. It just, uh, uh, and if so, if we want to open doors, that's the way to do it. The, uh, NASA's response, that's not our job to open doors like this. So we are actually just saying NASA shouldn't be leading the way to a new relationship with China. If there is that type of problem with communicating, it can be done by the State Department. Once again, as I read it, it says that as a section of the bill prohibiting NASA personnel or contractors from any exchange or contact with the People's Republic or any identity who is, who is headquartered in the People's Republic of China. So right. this is more than just that's entering into a contract. State, that's up to the Sorry. State Department. No, but, I mean, but your amendment goes, goes further. It just says that there can't be any contact. That's correct. Okay. I, well, I just want to be sure we knew. I would hope that we didn't do it with it. Herman Goring as well, you know. Uh, Mr. Wu is recognized. Well, um, I have deeply appreciated, I, I do deeply appreciate the gentleman's uh, strong, passionate, consistent uh, commitment to human rights, uh, regardless of location, regardless of the size of the entity uh, that the gentleman uh, is taking on. And I have, uh, I have uh, uh, worked with the gentleman on many of those human rights issues. Um, I, I part company with the gentleman on, on this particular amendment. Um, I think that there may be some limited opportunity uh, for uh, bringing the Chinese into a broader family of uh, spacefaring nations. But, you know, even short of uh, that potential future, uh, I think that uh, it's worth pointing out that we began our work uh, with the Russians when they were the Soviet Union. And as I recall, that process started in the early to mid-70s when the Russians and we had uh, thousands of nuclear weapons pointed at each other. And there was very, very limited technology transfer, per se. But we did, as I recall, have an Apollo-Soyuz uh, docking in space, and there was some controversy about that and, you know, whether it, it should have been done, but it led to several decades of, uh, uh, in my view, worthwhile space cooperation, and sometimes the international relationship has been testy, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the Soviet Union was not an exemplar of respect for human rights, or uh, did we share 
uh, a lot of uh, foreign policy interests. I, I want to note also would that you I, you? well, let me finish this okay. this this point, uh, which is that um, I was uh, I believe it was a foreign affairs hearing uh, where Secretary Gates. I think at that time, as uh, Defense Secretary for the Bush administration, uh, came in and, and testified that uh, to the, uh, testified that uh, he favored uh, sharing some space activities uh, with the Chinese uh, substantially to enhance our security interests uh, because that uh, better understanding both their intention and their capabilities uh, was inherently in our interest and having some confidence building uh, so that uh, we could uh, put pressure on them to um, not uh, target satellites as uh, most countries have, have, have done uh, so that we don't put a bunch of particles, uh, debris, in, 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 uh, into Earth orbit that you know that that's one thing to be avoided and the confidence building and the determination of capa uh, capability and intent in secretary gates's view was uh was well worth uh the, the risks of uh of uh contact with the chinese and w with that I, i'd be happy to yield to the gentleman for a moment yeah, well for a few points let's just note this that uh um when we had that space cooperation with the Soviet Union, I was opposed to that then. And so, uh, and let me just note that that did not make the world safer. That, in fact, was uh, uh, coincided with a massive buildup of Soviet weaponry uh, in which they uh, put a huge number of new missiles in Europe. And uh, so that, that, while it made people feel good, it was just the opposite impact in terms of the potential that it had for peace on this planet I, and what eventually it, made it, brought the Soviet Union down. Reclaiming my time, I'd like to ask the gentleman yes. if he thinks that those early efforts at space cooperation made any contribution to subsequent cooperation with respect to the International Space Station. Uh, in, in cooperation to the International Space Station, <laughs> let me think about that because it's a specific question as to that end. And by the way, I have been supportive of the International Space Station s cooperation since the reform has taken place <laughs> in what was the Soviet Union, which is now a, a reforming and potentially democratic Russia. But what changed? The Soviet Union, what brought down communist dictatorship, had nothing to do with the cooperation that, uh, that made people as, feel good at the as time. As my time is expiring, let me reclaim uh, that uh, I, I think that confidence building is very, very important, and, and that is certainly a worthy goal for our defense as well as for our space The gentleman's time has expired. If there's no further discussion. Uh, would, you, would the gentleman give me, uh, indulge me with one more minute? Of course. Uh, uh, with unanimous consent. Okay, about this specific, because this is a... Well, this is something I've lived on this. <clears throat> and uh, look, at a time when we were most cooperating with the Soviet Union and hoping that would have a beneficial effect, it had a negative effect. At that very time that we were cooperating uh, with these type of programs, they were pumping money into various countries of the world to, uh, to, to create revolution. They were dramatically expanding their military capabilities. That, that is what has happened with China as well, let me note. When we were cooperating with them in the space program, what has it, what was the result been? No, we've given them technology now that threatens the United States. What brought down the Soviet Union and made it a more peaceful world? What brought us to the point where Ronald Reagan could uh, reach an agreement to dramatically reduce the, the nuclear weapons in our arsenals? And by the way, I'm supportive of the current uh, efforts to reduce our nuclear arsenals. But what brought us to that point was when we supported those elements who were in opposition to the Soviet dictatorship, whether it was Afghanistan or Nicaragua or wherever, or, or, or Poland. That is what eventually brought about a more peaceful world. Not these, these very symbolic things, cooperation in the space. The time has expired. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed say no, no. Uh, uh, the, the no's have it. The sorry, I'm not... sorry to have to call for a roll call vote. Do you want a roll call vote or show of hands? Do you want everybody to come I want back? A roll call vote.
All right, Sorry. we'll have a roll this call vote. This is going to mean a lot to people in their districts. Uh, the uh, clerk will record the vote. Chairman Gordon. No. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson votes no. Ms. Woolsey. Mr. Wu. No. Mr. Wu votes no. Mr. Baird. Mr. Miller. We're outnumbered. <laughs> Mr. Miller votes no. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes no. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes no. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes no. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes no. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Matheson. Oh, Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell votes no. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson votes no. Mrs. Dahlkepper. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes no. Mr. Grayson. Mr. Grayson votes no. Mrs. Cosmas. Mrs. Cosmas votes no. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters votes no. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roy Barker. Mr. Roy Barker votes aye. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes aye. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Lucas. Mrs. Biggert. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. Mr. McCall. Mr. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bill Bray. Mr. Bill Bray votes aye. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Brown. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes aye. Mr. Rothman is not recorded. Mr. Rothman votes no. Mr. Baird is not recorded. Is there anyone that has not uh, had a chance to vote? Uh, Mr. Smith. Uh, you're not recorded. Would you like to be? And so, uh, would you like to tell us what that would be? 
Mr. Adrian Smith votes aye. Correct. Yes. Is there anyone else that has not been recorded? If, if not, please uh, report the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have six members voting aye and 20 members voting no. The uh, ayes have it, the amendment, uh, excuse me, the oh, noes have it, uh, pardon me, the uh, already brainwashed by those folks. The, um, the noes have it, the amendment is not uh, agreed to. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentlelady from Maryland. Ms. Edwards, are you ready to proceed with your amendment? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 063, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Ms. Edwards of Maryland. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentlelady for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also to thank you to Ranking Member Hall, because I think sometimes we hear about how, you know, horrible it is around here and members can't work together across the aisles, and I always think that this uh, committee really displaces that little rumor. Um, and I uh, appreciate what we've tried to do here to, um, to make sure that we cover a lot of different bases and concerns um, with the NASA um, reauthorization. My amendment concerns retaining highly skilled and talented uh, NASA workers for the new NASA future. As you know, my service on this committee, I've always raised the question about what I believe is the need to retain the internal capacity at NASA so they have the ability to oversee, to manage, um, to direct and influence um, the many talented um, contractors who do so much of the work uh, for the agency. And I believe that sustaining and building upon that talented reserve should be our first priority as we move forward with this authorization. Um, because nothing in this bill can happen really without our skilled workforce. We should recognize that the new authorization is itself a transition. It lays the groundwork for the future, and it's about the expertise and oversight that we could potentially lose. Um, and so what my amendment does is merely extend the current moratorium against reductions in force that's received unanimous, really nearly unanimous, bipartisan support since 2004. Uh, this policy was embraced in 2005 and 2008 uh, reauthorization acts controlled by both parties. And given the, given the looming retirement of the shuttle, this language is particularly important for upwards of thousands of NASA employees, um, particularly at jo Johnson Space Center and at Kennedy Space Flight Center, who will be caught up in the transition over the next uh, few years of this new reauthorization. Uh, the language is also important for all NASA employees, however. Um, those who are at Goddard Space Flight Center in the county that's my home uh, would be impacted. And I know that some have suggested that the moratorium keeps workers in jobs that shouldn't exist uh, with a changing mission, but I think it's really to the contrary. The NASA workforce is very uh, fluid and adaptable and is skilled. And um, in this important transition, filling those functions um, the way that the agency needs to uh, will help the agency transition uh, now during this uh, authorization period. Uh, the key point here is that we need internal capacity for technical uh, oversight um, of, of the agency, and I think also the psychological impact already of what we're doing um, in this period has been really tremendous on all of the NASA workforce. In fact, you know, pretty demoralizing sometimes from what I can hear. Everyone feels tar are targeted. Uh, so we need to make sure that our workers know that they're supported, um, that we value what they're doing, that they have something important to contribute and continue a policy uh, that we've had for the last several years. Um, and uh, obviously the amendment is endorsed by a number of the representatives of workers um, at all of these NASA facilities. I encourage my colleagues to support the continued moratorium through the, um, this authorization period and to support our workforce. And with that, I would, uh, would yield. Mr. Hall is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I reluctantly support the gentlelady's amendment. I don't like to protect only civil service employees while thousands of contractors' jobs are being eliminated. But we do need to do everything we can to ensure our talented workforce remains intact. For that reason, I support the amendment. 
Thank you, Mr. Hall. Let me, first of all, I would agree uh, with Ms. Edwards that we have a very talented NASA workforce, and I would certainly like to see that maintained at full strength and expanded. But let's be realistic here. This is a five-year uh, moratorium on past, uh, on past moratoriums. Um, we simply have to give the agency more flexibility than that. Um, clearly, the, uh, uh, if there is, you know, we're looking at a change direction in, in many ways for NASA. If there is someone in NASA uh, that can do another job, it makes no sense that they're going to fire them and hire somebody else. Of course NASA is going to move all the employees that they can into these new jobs. I just think that we need to provide more flexibility uh, to the agency. Uh, otherwise, uh, we could have a workforce uh, that then does not allow you to hire new people that have these new skills, or uh, it just is not, in, in my opinion, on top of all the others, uh, it doesn't give adequate uh, flexibility for NASA. So I would reluctantly have to oppose this amendment. Is there further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. aye. Oppose nay. Nay. Mr. Chairman. Uh, could we do it by, by hand? I'd ask for a recorded vote. We'll do a recorded vote. The clerk will call the vote. I mean, the record, we're, we're, we'll, we'll call, and I hope the clerk will move along with um, good uh, rhythm because we have just a few minutes. Chairman Gordon. No. Nope. Chairman Gordon votes no. Mr. Costello. Ms. Johnson. Ms. Woolsey. Ms. Woolsey votes aye. Mr. Wu. Mr. Baird. Mr. Baird votes no. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller votes no. Mr. Lipinski. Ms. Giffords. Ms. Giffords votes no. Ms. Edwards. Ms. Edwards votes aye. Ms. Fudge. Ms. Fudge votes aye. Mr. Lujan. Mr. Lujan votes aye. Mr. Tonko. Mr. Tonko votes aye. Mr. Rothman. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Davis. Mr. Chandler. Mr. Carnahan. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes no. Mr. Mitchell. Yes. Mr. Mitchell votes aye. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Mr. Wilson votes aye. Mrs. Dahlkepper. Mrs. Dahlkepper votes no. Mr. Grayson. Aye. Mr. Grayson votes aye. Ms. Cosmas. Ms. Cosmas votes aye. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Peters votes no. Mr. Garamendi. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes no. Mr. Sensenbrenner. Mr. Lamar Smith. Mr. Roybacher. Mr. Roybacher votes no. Mr. Bartlett. Mr. Bartlett votes no. Mr. Ehlers. Mr. Lucas. Mrs. Biggert. Mrs. Biggert votes no. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Nagabauer. Mr. Inglis. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. McCall. Mr. McCall votes no. Mr. Diaz Ballart. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes no. Mr. Adrian Smith. Mr. Adrian Smith votes no. Mr. Brown. Mr. Olson. Mr. Olson votes no. Is there uh, Mr. Matheson? Mr. Matheson votes no. Mr. Wu? Aye. Mr. Wu votes aye. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. We're Matheson, how are you recorded? No. The Mr. clerk report? Who was after Mr. Matheson? Mr. Wu. Mr. Wu, he votes aye. Did you get Ms. Johnson? No. Ms. Johnson, how would you like to be recorded? <laughs> Is there, oh, Mr. Lipinski? Mr. Lipinski's not recorded. Mr. Lipinski votes no. 
We have two minutes and 44 seconds for the next vote. So the report, the clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, I have 12 members voting aye and 18 members voting no. The uh, no's prevail. The, the amendment is, does not pass. And uh, let me announce that we have two more amendments. Um, and I appreciate three amendments. Oh, we have three amendments. Uh, so we will come back immediately after this vote uh, to finish the bill. Thank you. The committee will come uh, back to order. Let's see. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment offered by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall. The patient gentleman from Texas, Thank Mr. You. McCall. Thank you, Mr. Are you, Chairman. Are you ready to proceed? I am, and I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 002, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. McCall. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me, uh, I don't think this has been said enough today, but let me commend you and the ranking member and Ms. Giffords and Mr. Olson for a, uh, a uh, fine job, a bipartisan piece of legislation that not only reauthorizes the human space uh, flight program, but saves, restores, and advances uh, human space flight. And I want to thank you personally for that. And uh, with that, uh, my amendment... Um, basically provides for a sense of the Congress that uh, NASA should attempt to carry out the top recommendations of the decadal survey where possible. Uh, the decadal sur survey puts forth recommendations for NASA research, which is developed uh, by the top scientists in their fields. And in the past years, NASA experienced dramatic funding shortfalls when the budget and appropriations did not adequately fund the agency. The NASA administrator had the authority and exercised his authority to move large funding amounts from the science missions, including the top recommendations of the decadal survey mission areas, in order to cover the budget uh, shortfalls in other areas. And as a result, this hurt the progress of the missions and put them behind schedule. At a minimum, NASA should be given priority to planning, designing, funding, and executing the top recommendations from the decadal survey in each mission area. Uh, and while the current amendment language is, in this, is a sense of Congress, I would like to be able to work with the chairman and the ranking member uh, to strengthen this language as the bill uh, moves to the floor. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. McCall, and thank you for your endurance today. You have a good amendment, and uh, I think the committee should support it. Uh, Mr. Hall is recognized. Common sense amendment, I support it. If there's no further discussion, the vote is on the amendment from the gentleman from Texas. Mr. McCall, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is passed. The next amendment on the roster is an amendment by Mr. Sensenbrenner and Mr. Miller, a bipartisan amendment, and I think Mr. Miller is going to, going to carry that. Thank you. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment number 041, amendment to H.R. 5781, offered by Mr. Sensenbrenner of Wisconsin and Mr. Miller of North Carolina. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner and I disagreed about an uh, amendment earlier today, but this, uh, this amendment restores the happy harmony that usually exists between uh, Mr. Right. Sensenbrenner and me. Um, in our work on the Investigations and Oversight Subcommittee, uh, we have been, Mr. Sensenbrenner and I, have been disappointed in the role of the NASA Council, uh, Office of General Counsel. Uh, what, what I think uh, we want a general counsel to do is advise government agencies to follow both the letter and the spirit of the law. Uh, it appeared in, with respect to two instances uh, that we know of that instead of doing that, the um, general counsel's office or the general counsel determined uh, that what 
management wanted to do was something other than what the letter and spirit of the law allowed uh, or required. Uh, and in tell, instead of telling them to do, uh, do what the law required, uh, seemed to help them think through a strategy for how to uh, do something different and get away with it. Uh, this amendment requires ethics training for the members of the, the uh, council's office, the licensed attorneys in that office, and it moves the position of ethics officer away from the, uh, from the council. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Miller, and uh, thank you, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for bringing us this excellent amendment. Is there further discussion? If no, all in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. The, I think the last amendment is a modified amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters. Are you ready to proceed with your amendment? I am, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment to H.R. 5781 offered by Mr. Peters of Michigan. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading. Without objection, so ordered. I recognize the gentleman for five minutes to explain the amendment. Uh, I'll be very brief because I explained it uh, before him, Mr. Chairman. Uh, basically, this amendment uh, requests that the administrator uh, conduct a, uh, a study on the use of radiation uh, research on non-human primates. It was mentioned in my initial comments. Uh, uh, this is research that has been done for 40 years, and uh, there are now other ways of conducting the same sort of uh, radiation uh, experiments uh, without using non-human uh, primates. Uh, the European Space Agency, for example, no longer uses non-human primates. Uh, the U.S. Air Force has put out a, a fairly detailed report as to why they have moved away from this as well. Uh, this will also, this uh, amendment simply asks NASA to uh, present a report uh, before uh, any additional research. If they have anything that they're doing now, they can continue, but uh, they need to provide justification and rationale for any additional research and would urge adoption. Is there further? Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Wu's rec oh, let's see. Let's go to the right first. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Right. Bartlett's recognized. Oh, okay. uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was part of the research team that uh, put the first primates in space. It was more than half a century ago. I was a school physiologist at Pensacola, Florida. We had a, uh, an army monkey and a navy monkey. Their monkey was a rhesus monkey. Ours was a spider monkey, the ones they are anticipating using here. And um, uh, it was a suborbital flight, so I'm not a priori opposed to appropriately using uh, animals. But I rise in strong support of this amendment. I think that the, uh, if they did this research they're talking about, it would be duplicative. And as a scientist, I have some real concern about the validity of this kind of research. Uh, radiation is a stressor, but these animals are already enormously stressed. Uh, these are not the, the affectionate um, uh, spider monkeys that the organ grinder uses, although they are the same spider monkeys. These are monkeys that have forced incarceration, which they keenly resent, and uh, they are enormously stressed. So I don't know how you pretend that you're going to measure the effects of an additional stress radiation when you already have animals that are enormously stressed. And as Mr. Peters mentioned, we've now pretty much moved beyond this. We don't need whole body exposures anymore because we know the target organs. We do a lot of, of a tissue culture research, and so I think not only would these experiments be duplicative, they are needless because today we've moved beyond that and we're doing tissue culture studies and, and so forth. Uh, so I rise in strong support of this amendment. I hope that it can be passed. I think it sends the right message. Thank you. Mr. Wu is recognized. I, I do agree that a study is in order, and I support the amendment. Mr. Garamendi, would, would you – I yield back the balance of my time. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, the vote occurs on the amendment. All in favor say aye. On the modified amendment, all, all, all members say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Are there any other amendments? If no, then the vote is on the bill as amended. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no, no, the ayes have it. Uh, the, 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 well, let me make sure that I was just saying no as, that was, as an option for someone. I was not uh, voting no. Uh, I was voting aye, so there will be no misunderstanding. I now recognize Mr. Hall for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee favorably report H.R. 5781 as amended to the House with the recommendation that the bill do pass 
Furthermore, I move that staff instructed to prepare the legislative report and make necessary technical and conforming changes, and that the chairman take all necessary steps to bring the bill before the House for consideration. I yield back. The question is on the motion to report the bill favorably. Those in favor of the motion uh, will signify by saying aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The, uh, the bill is reported favorably. Uh, without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. Members will have two subsequent calendar days in which to submit supplemental, minority, or additional views on the measure. Let me say to Mr. Hall, Mr. Ms. Giffords, uh, Mr. Olson, job well done. Uh, let me particularly say to the staff uh, that has put so much time into this, we, we thank you for that. Uh, I will be the first to say this is not a perfect bill because we do not have the perfect amount of money. Uh, but we, we're going to move forward to the uh, to a conference, uh, to the floor, and we welcome additional improvements to the bill as we go along. And again, thank you all. And this uh, hearing is adjourned. Well, then, need to take you to okay. Going home. I am. Yeah. Chairman. See you later.